let's start. Oh, no. We have a problem with technology, I think. Okay. Um, <coughs> seat 34 is also okay. Can you, is that okay? Right, we'll, we'll start the meeting again. Um, <coughs> welcome to everybody dialing in. My apologies for the uh, uh, sound problems there. Uh, welcome to the public board meeting of the Care Quality Commission. Uh, 22nd of May 2024 for those live or as a record for those watching it on uh, catch up. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, we have a, a meeting of about two and a half hours. Um, <clears throat> we would like just to give a few apologies and welcome a few guests that we have here today. Um, <clears throat> Sean O'Kelly, uh, our Chief Inspector of Healthcare, is regrettably still not well, so he won't uh, be with us today. Uh, but we have uh, four people who are joining us uh, predominantly as observers, so um, uh, sitting at the back of the room and people on camera may or may not see them, but I should mention their names anyway. Uh, we have uh, Mary Mamvori from the uh, National Professional Advisor of Mental Health Nursing, so she's um, part of a shadowing programme joining us today. Um, Elaine Mulangani, uh, who is uh, joined as the new Governance Manager, and as part of uh, getting into her role, is, is sitting in on a number of um, board meetings, including board meetings. Uh, and as among guests, uh, Thomas Bentham, uh, <coughs> we are conducting a board effectiveness review at the moment, and we have an observer from the uh, organisation we've appointed to do the work for us. So welcome to them. And then um, actually joining us in the meeting, uh, but... Uh, online is Hannah Sterland, who's our Disability Equality Network representative. So Hannah, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, could I ask my colleagues if there's any new declarations of interest to note? Okay. Um, I have no planned changes to the agenda. Nothing urgent has come to my attention. Is there anything else people want to flag that should be doing differently? Okay. Well, if not, let's move straight on to the uh, main uh, business of the organisation. Perhaps I could turn to you, Ian, to uh, do the report from the executive. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Um, so I, I'm just uh, just going through the uh, the report. I'm, I'll just do what I usually do and, and briefly step through the, um, the, the the report and then take questions at, at the end. Um, kicking off with um, just, does the microphone sound weird, or can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I think Hannah's indicating she can hear me, so I'll carry on. Um, so, kicking off with uh, with culture change and pe and people. Kicking off with cul kicking off with culture change and people. Um, we've commenced an important piece of work to refresh our decade-old values. Um, now is a good time, uh, following our following the sort of. Drawing to, to, drawing to the end of our transformation program to start to look at, at our, our values. We've had 1,200 colleagues who have been part of the work so far um, through a series of to continue through through the rest of May and, and into June, uh, and there may be some, some follow-on activity in the early part of July uh, as well. And we'll be coming back to board uh, with, with uh, recommendations that encompass all of the voices of our colleagues in terms of what, uh, what values we should have. Uh, we've also continued with the successful manager pathway, 147 colleagues in two cohorts have started the program, uh, which has helped to develop our, our first line managers and give them the skills that they need to, to operate in, in our current working environment. In terms of, of race and inclusion, we've had a, we, we made a clear commitment as a board uh, in, in, as part of the listening, learning and responding to concerns review uh, a year or so ago uh, and we've continued to do a couple of sessions. Um, we had one which was focused internally and one which was focused uh, externally and, and the way in which we regulate and the way we talk about uh, inequalities in, through the voice of regulation. Um, and, and that work will continue including cascading the work to senior leaders as well. In terms of technology, data and insight, uh, there's been a big focus on supporting colleagues in bedding down the new, the new platform, along with streamlining the assessment service, uh, the ent our, our contact, cent our, our contact uh, centre contact services, and of course the registration service, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of that work later on. Um, the, our new portal has been updated and we now have uh, over 11,000 people enrolled on the portal. 
uh, it's being extensively tested uh, and, and monitored in the live system at the moment. So we've got a small number of providers who are... In the live in the live service, we haven't yet commenced marketing that that to um, more more widely, but we will be doing that in the next uh, next few weeks when we're confident that all of the services that that support the portal uh, are, are all working working well in order to make sure that providers have a good experience. Our new intranet uh, titled Home is now live and performing performing well. It's available for the first time uh, on people's phones, which means the colleagues will be able to access uh, intranet, uh, the, the intranet directly on their phone. It means that when they're out and about uh, on inspection and so forth, they can get access to guidance and so forth, which, is, which I know colleagues have wanted for quite some time now. Uh, data and insight teams continue to support uh, important external publications alongside supporting work on the reports coming out, out of our national maternity inspection work and that's all due to publish in July. Uh, in, regulatory, in, the, in the regulatory leadership team we've got six uh, current areas of focus, dementia strategy, inequalities in health uh, and, uh, and, uh, and mortality, um, health, mental health mortality, mental health in black men, children's health and deteriorating patients. These are our priorities which the Reg Leadership team have picked up from our regulatory work uh, and they're going to do more, more work to, to work out what, what we can do from a regulatory point of view to positively influence all of those topics. Uh, in terms of our local authority assurance work, we've got three, three reports were published earlier this week and they were well received by the, by the councils involved. And work is now uh, ramping up with a number of new colleagues to, uh, to, to do that work at pace. In terms of our integrated, uh, integrated care system work, uh, we continue to discuss with uh, DHSC the detail of the rollout of this work. Uh, and I know James has, James has been leading that personally. He'll be able to talk to that if anyone would like to follow up on that. And we'll, we will publish our consultation on uh, the fee scheme uh, at once, we ha once we've had the necessary government approvals uh, for our, our work, uh, but, be but in any event before we commence ICS assessment. Um, and of course the work on maternity services and urgent and emergency services uh, continues at pace as well. Um, our colleagues that joined us in last October from MNSI uh, have, 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 are now getting much more integrated into our core teams. Uh, we've included the team in our regular performance reporting for this year, so again we'll be talking about, about their, their performance as we go throughout the year. Um, I wanted to, to flag the, 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 uh, the publication earlier this month of the report that MNSI have done on birth centres. Uh, that's a thematic uh, review that they did learning from uh, 92 MNSI investigations that, that they did. Uh, and then finally, uh, engagement. We continue to, to actively engage in a range of topics uh, and they're listed on page 17 and 18 of, of the pack, both with parliamentarians and, and, uh, and elsewhere. So that's all I've got to say for now, Ian, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ian. Uh, just before we move to questions, Kate, I think there was a people update you were going to mention. Yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So just to let you know, we have made an appointment to our uh, Director of Governance, Performance and Assurance. A colleague called um, Sean Cornell will be joining us on the 1st of July. So Sean comes to us from uh, Natural England, where he's currently Director of Assurance and Corporate Governance. So we're really looking forward to welcoming Sean. And when Sean arrives, so the 1st of July will be the point that we establish our two new directorates. So you'll know at the moment we've currently got a Directorate of Governance and Legal Services following the work of our Corporate Services services review, we are going to be moving to a Directorate of Legal Services and our new Directorate of Governance, Performance and Assurance. So uh, just to let you know that uh, Sean is arriving and at that point we'll be st establishing the two new directors. Thank you. Thanks Kate. And I mean it's good news we've managed to recruit but also I mean a welcome development or continued uh, uh, bolstering up of our, our governance and assurance side. So thank you for that. Uh, I turn to my colleagues for questions on anything Ian said of the papers. Stephen. Thank you, Chair. Could I just pick out and warmly welcome uh, what's said about uh, maternity? Because it feels hugely important when the safety and quality of care in maternity units is still a matter of kind of widespread public concern that we keep our focus on it. And I know some really important work is being done to, to, to take the learning 
from the great work that our own teams did to go out and inspect maternity units so that we can be clear about sort of what are the, the, the contributing characteristics of poor and good performance so that the whole system can learn from it, including our, our own teams on future inspections. So I just wanted to sort of warmly welcome the profile we're giving to that follow-up work on maternity. Thanks, Stephen. I, and I think it's, it's, uh, we're, we're doing, doing follow-up work in, in sort of two broad, broad groups. One is to summarise the things we found on those uh, during, during that overall programme. But also, I think more importantly, working and collaborating with with practitioners. There's certainly a, a number of other other organisations and people that work in these services who are really keen to to improve and to learn lessons. And we want to try and be a, a rallying point for, for that. So um, again, we're trying to we we we're, we're delivering kind of almost two two final reports there. One, a sort of summary of what we found. The other one is 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 is, is really starting to summarise that and say what what sort of services, if you will, that, that can we um, can, can we help the, help people improve on. So no. It's it's a, good, it's a good point. Thank you. Any other questions, colleagues? You, you did flag, well, others, I think you did flag James, uh, might comment on the where we are in ICS as James. Are we able to say any more? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ian, and good afternoon, everybody. Yes, sir. I mean, it's probably worth um, reminding ourselves at the board that the, our ICS approach, much like the local authority approach, is particularly determined by the minister and the ministers uh, under the Health and Care Act. So it's a slightly different arrangement than we have than our regular inspection um, uh, powers. Um, we are, in fact, making progress in our, in our discussions with um, the department. So we are, we are still um, working through with the minister and with the department um, the finalisation of how we will report. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very conscious that um, that is holding up the publication of the two pilot reports that we uh, completed with the uh, two systems in Birmingham and Solihull uh, and Dorset and we're ready, we're ready as it were um, for the publication of both our evaluation, the consultation of fees and those two reports and we're, we're committed to publishing those as soon as we um, have agreed the overall methodology uh, with the department. I anticipate that um, following a further um, uh, inclusive event with uh, partners in the NHS um, and with the department um, in early June that we will um, be uh, hopefully coming to a conclusion in June and back at the July board with the um, uh, c conclusion as it were of, um, of the process. Okay, thanks very much and, and just to clarify a couple of things we did discuss or, or request I think at a previous meeting to make sure that we'd written to ISS leaders to update them and I think you said in your paper we have I suppose that's I'm asking you to affirm what you wrote, but I'll ask anyway. Uh, and the other is, um, we did a consultation on our fee arrangements, and my understanding is we should have published that by now, but I guess that's being held up while this continues. So we probably have to fail to comply with something, whatever we do now. Um, but where are, we, where are we on compliance with the general rules of publishing the response to that consultation? Yes, as you say, we are beyond uh, the good practice uh, <coughs> requirement for us to have published that. Um, so I think we're now uh, around uh, well over 20 weeks since we concluded that. So we do need to uh, be aware of that. I, I, I suppose, though, we have been uh, public, as it were, about the position and our intention, been very clear about that. And, and as soon as um, the methodology is, is applied, we will uh, prospectively then uh, implement that. Um, and just on the point of engaging with the ICSs on this question, so myself and Chris Day are, in, are engaged with the ICS leaders, uh, formally convened by the um, NHS Confederation, and we've got a meeting coming up uh, with ICS leaders to, to give them a further update on our on our position, and indeed in, to engage them as well in in the um, in, in our potential proposals for for amendments to our way of reporting going forwards. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Colleagues, David. Chair, if I may, a question following what James just said and uh, partly to Chris. In terms of our relationships with the integrated care systems, which James just referred to, um, have we got in place um, speaking events at their various sort of conferences and collection regionally and nationally? Um, it's a great question. So we've been really fortunate in our conversations with NHS Confederation 
to be able to work with them to, to do exactly as you say, to make sure that we're able to have good conversations with them. We've also been working with the pilot sites to try and ensure that we can bring them with us into a conversation about what happens. Clearly what they're looking for is a relationship between what we intend to assess as part of our ICS framework and the oversight framework that NHS England uh, has in place as well. So what we're trying to do is to show the links between the two, but to show uh, obviously what they're doing is complementary to each other. Uh, but as, as James said, uh, NHS Confed, we've been in a conversation with them for some time now, and they're, they're really keen to act as a bridge for those conversations into the ICS networks. And in terms of speaking events, Chris? Yes, well, so for example, we'll be talking about this at NHS Confederation this year. We'll be using, the, there are a number of both national and regional speaking events hosted by uh, both NHS providers, NHS Confederation and the ICBs themselves. And we're, our aim is to make sure that we can talk with confidence about our plans working alongside uh, NHS England at those events. James, sorry, another one from me then. I mean, we talked about the work at ICS, as obviously we were able to start the uh, work at local authorities earlier in uh, April. So it was early, very early days, but any feedback on how that's going? Well, um, as, um, as Ian uh, referred to, we published the three first reports uh, last week, last Friday, and, and to some interest, um, in both in terms of those local areas, but more broadly across across local governments. Um, they were three good reports, but we were demonstrating in their publication the range of uh, di di differing uh, findings relating to, uh, as it were, um, the score, the way our scoring system works in, in producing a good. So it, it, we continue to find the common issues that um, we had um, begun, begun to discover in the pilots, including issues like uh, waiting times for services and the impact of um, uh, people's care on their lives and also the commissioning arrangements, particularly with, with um, the fragility of the social care market. Um, so those are common themes that are coming through. Um, it might seem that three reports are few in number, and as the um, as our papers show, we're, we are, as it were, completed six site visits. In fact, the way we work is that we um, announce in the next quarter who is going to be, uh, who is in our sites, as it were, for assurance, and then we write to them six weeks before we're coming. So, in fact, the numbers mean that we are now in touch with 35 councils um, for that process, and that number will begin to build. Uh, would be in the 40s uh, in, in July and so on uh, to get through the 150 for over two years. The point of raising that is that this has an anticipatory effect for, for the 35 and then for the other people who are, as it were, waiting um, for our process to, to appear in their, uh, in their locale. So I think as well as what we're finding, we're also finding that local authorities are, as it were, making themselves as best prepared for our process and in doing that are making improvements in their delivery of services. Yes, I must admit, I picked that up from other sources as well, people I've been speaking to, that it has uh, led to change and indeed therefore some improvement. So it's, uh, it's a bit like doing one of these community speed watch things, isn't it? I mean, you, is success not catching people or catching people? Anyway, thank you very much indeed for the update. Any other questions from colleagues? No? Okay, well, Ian, thank you very much indeed for that. Obviously, the paper is very comprehensive. Um, we're going to move on to the um, single assessment framework implementation. Uh, so this is variable. We don't have any uh, papers for it. Uh, but I think probably over to you and you can update us on, on where we are. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Quite a lot to update. So just I think just as by way of background, uh, over the last few months we've been working hard to roll out a, a new approach to the way that we <coughs> regulate. Um, this has involved changes to, the, to how we organise ourselves, uh, new policies and a total replacement of our of our overall technology, uh, and this has been incredibly ambitious as a as a program. And we of course uh, of course have met a number of challenges as a consequence of that. Um, I think we've now got to a point where all of our assessment services are, are live, with the most recent uh, turning on of assessment services for dentists and a range of other providers who we don't rate. Uh, we often call them other assessment services. 
Um, I want to pay tribute to begin with by, by, to all of our colleagues who've been working incredibly hard to, uh, to get us to, to, to this point and specifically to manage the old system whilst moving on and training on the new system. Um, that has been, that has been a, a, a particularly difficult uh, journey for a number of colleagues uh, in, and, and they're doing all of that in the context of a very challenged uh, health and care system. So they're trying to, to make sure that we can protect the public, manage the risks that, that uh, help, help manage the risks of those services whilst at the same time getting ready to, to move on to new services, which is, has been a, a, huge, a huge undertaking. Um, as we've been rolling out the, the, um, the, 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 the new approach in phases, we've been doing that deliberately so that we can make sure that there isn't a, a big impact all in one go. Um, it's also meant that we've also left old services running at the same time as, as, as moving on to new services. And that obviously creates, creates a, a whole set of risks and a whole set of, of challenges. On balance, it was probably the right thing to do, but it doesn't alter the fact that there's some real, real and significant um, challenges. Um, it means that, that, that providers and the public have, have always been able to contact us and continue to be able to contact us as we are rolling out, out new services. Um, but it has meant that there's been some, some confusion. I know within some providers have asked, you know, what's the, what's the right thing to be doing at the moment? And particularly there was a point where providers who had a national footprint were doing one thing in one part of the country and a slightly different thing in a, in a different part of the country, which obviously is, is a challenge. And that's been a, a, real, a real challenge to communicate that level of complexity uh, consistently and, and well all of the time. So based on, on feedback that we've had from our own teams and from providers, uh, we've had we've been doing lots of, of work with providers directly or through provider groups. We've also been been talking intensively to our own colleagues internally, getting feedback through through in-house meetings, uh, conferences, and and so forth. Um, it means that we've been, we we are now working on on a number of specific areas. First line, first one is 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 addressing the backlogs in registration. We know that the um, the, the registration team have, have been under an enormous pressure over the last over the last six months in particular, but probably a little bit longer than that. We're, we're, we've had some of the highest levels of inbound registration queries that, that we've ever had over the last few months. That's meant that the backlogs were, had built up in registration before we started to go live on, on the new on the new system, and that that I know that's a, a challenge. Um, a big thank you to the registration team uh, who've been working incredibly hard to, to address those the, those backlogs, uh, and also a big thank you to to providers for their patience. I know I know a number of providers have, have rightly sort of had raised concerns with us that they're worried about the uh, the backlogs and the time it takes to get things to get things done. We have got a, a fast track process for those providers who who um, who are supporting uh, at the NHS in particular, uh, but also where there's particular challenges in social care in a particular area, we can fast track. Uh, applications uh, and we and we've done exactly that but I, I think in, in general terms for a number of providers they found it they found it quite frustrating and and, um, and I'm hoping that that with the advent of having uh, increased the number of people in registration by by over 40% um, and, and an ongoing recruitment uh, campaign plus the going the go live on the new new system that should start to make a difference over the over the coming over coming weeks um, Designing a new approach in the way that in the way that we manage uh, relationships is the second area that uh, that I want to just just to flag. Um, it, it's one of those things that we were always concerned that the individual uh, individual uh, inspectors were having untenable workloads in our old method, uh, and they weren't always able to offer offer providers the sort of the sort of relationship management, the sort of service that, that we'd want. And equally, it meant that we were we there were times when when we needed to understand how risk was being managed in a provider, uh, and that wasn't done as well as it could have done. The new method uh, is uh, the, the new the new system offers us a number of of pieces of functionality which are helpful, but more importantly, the way in which we manage the relationship with providers is something we're doing some work on at the moment, and we're hoping to um, to talk to, to to be in a position to to start to talk to providers openly about that in July uh, and talk to them about how we're going to uh, to manage those relationships, which 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 addresses the the concerns that both providers have had, but also our own teams internally to make sure that 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 relationship management approach is, is manageable. Um, we've also been doing some work internally around ensuring that our managers have the flexibility to, to deploy their teams uh, and, and, and to get specialist support uh, in the most effective way. 
And what that means in turn from a, from a provider point of view is we can be much clearer on what's planned and what is responsive work. We want to be much clearer about, about the fact that we are still um, doing a, a significant amount of work based on, on, on perceptions of risk. But we also need to give providers confidence that, that we will come back to their to, to, to those uh, those providers that haven't had an inspection for a while, those pa- providers who perhaps have got a, a, an aging rating. A bit, and we, we know in particular that providers who are rated requires improvement in social care have had some real concerns about how frequently they're going to come back. We want to be in a position o- over the next couple of months to, to, to again to talk openly about when, when we're likely to return. And the work we're doing internally around productivity gives us that sense of what our capacity is uh, and, and how likely we are, or how, how or when we're going to come back. Um, we've also got a very significant programme of work uh, and, and investment to learn lessons from the first uh, few months of the new system uh, to fix uh, the issues that inevitably are, are, are going to appear in, uh, in, in new systems and to make changes to offer our teams uh, and providers a better experience. We know that as soon as you start using a live system, a number of things which uh, which, which you which couldn't possibly be predicted start to become obvious. Uh, and again, we want to be in a position to rapidly respond to that and make sure that we can uh, link services together. Um, this, in turn, uh, drives up our ability to to get to more providers uh, and offer the public the most up to date uh, uh, up to date picture of ratings. We're also continuing to review how we communicate all of this. Um, I recognise that in doing this, um, that there's a number of things which will have gone very well for people. Equally, there will be a number of things that haven't gone well for people. Uh, and a lot of the, the reasons for this are quite detailed and in some cases quite technical. Um, and communicating that in a way that's clear both to our internal colleagues and also to providers uh, and is up to date uh, is, is, remains a, um, a challenge. Um, we're trying to balance sort of too little communication with unhelpful and complex communication. And I acknowledge that sometimes we get that right and sometimes we, we maybe don't. But we've been working with providers directly, with provider representative groups and, uh, and, and others. And we've been doing the same internally as well. Um, we have got a, a we have short-term work that's fixing uh, these, these, these uh, issues a long time, uh, alongside a longer-term programme of, uh, of work. To develop new functions and to start to start to make sure make the, um, the 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 system much easier to use both for providers and for our internal people, uh, we're also looking at at our policy. Uh, we know the single assessment framework as a as a as a as a, um, as, a as a concept as a as a as a basic frame is, has been well received both internally and externally. Uh, the idea of of the framework seems to make sense to people. Um, but are there some specific rules within it that, that in terms of how we execute on it that, that we need to change? And again, we're actively looking at that to see if there are, there are small tweaks and changes we can make over the next weeks and months that, to make, make the system easier to, easier to work. And, and I'm particularly uh, concerned about making sure that the new system and how it interacts with the old system works really well. I think the single assessment framework on its own makes complete sense, but that transition from old to new is something which I know some providers have, have, have really questioned with us. And uh, anything we can do to, to make that uh, clearer and and obviously fair, because I think there is something here about making making um, making our, our work clear and transparent to providers, so they understand how we go from here to there, uh, and they see see any ratings as being fair. And equally, those ratings are as up to date as they can be, and they make sense to the to the to the public. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, at internal work to look at the at, at the way in which the internal teams collaborate with one another. Whether we need to make some small changes to and, and tweaks to job roles to make sure that so that all job roles are, are are achievable. We do know that some of our our, our colleagues have, have have really raised concerns about about volumes of work as part of this this process. And again, that's something which is being actively looked at to try and make sure that that, uh, that our, our frontline managers can can do the work that, that we want them to do. Um, I think all of this taken together means that it will, I, I hope, start to drive up our, our ability to cover the ground in the short term. That in turn gives us the, the, um, the capacity to make sure that we're going to the right places, which in turn gives us the ability to give the public the assurance that they need around the, the safety and quality of the care that's uh, delivered in this country. Um, if I pause there, Ian, I know a number of colleagues will, will probably want to come in and, and pick up individual details. Thank you. So, <coughs> 
some questions, but we'll turn over to the colleagues first. And Hannah, you're, uh, <clears throat> if you wish to chip in as well, I won't come to you for a question, but if you wish to chip in, please feel free to do so. Though I can't actually necessarily see your uh, hand on the system, so wave or something, I'll know to bring you in. Um, colleagues, questions, comments? Steve. Uh, firstly, uh, I'd just like to pay a huge tribute to all colleagues across the whole organisation for the immense amount of work that has gone into this whole transformation programme. It's been big, it's been ambitious, it's been very challenging, and I think colleagues have worked incredibly hard uh, to, uh, to, to implement it effectively. And we're just in that phase where I think for many colleagues it's feeling very challenging indeed. Um, you know, they're, they're trying to get to grips with new ways of working where many, many moving parts are all changing at the same time. And uh, as, uh, as Ian described absolutely rightly, kind of we need as a board to... To, to, to own the program that now helps colleagues come back up the other side and feel confident that within these new ways of working, amended, tweaked, adjusted as they need to be, they can see a way to delivering their jobs effectively, efficiently, professionally to give the results that they are all highly motivated to give, which is reliable, accurate ratings that promote safety, promote quality of care across the whole system. So it's trying to sort of now identify the adjustments and the changes that we need to make to address the frustrations, the unexpected consequences of what's been put in place so far to give our colleagues that reassurance that you know we can get to the end of this transition phase and and they will be able to, to, to deliver their roles in the way they want to professionally and to high quality and I think that's a responsibility on 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 all of us as board members Thanks. do you want to comment here I mean I, I was going to make a similar point Stephen so thank you for doing it but yeah okay. do you want to respond um, yeah thank, thanks Stephen I, I think I think that's that's exactly right I think We've a number of us, including a number of non-exec colleagues, have been to various uh, conferences with ops group uh, colleagues over the last uh, last few weeks, and I think time and again that that real visceral sense of, of wanting to do the right thing and, and wanting to make a difference for the for, for, for people that use services is, is comes through time and again, and the question for us really is how do we get to a point where we can um, offer people the tools and techniques. That they need to, to deliver the great job that I know they they, they want to they, they want to deliver, and as I say we've got a lot of work in the in the background, um, which which in in detail covers this off. It it, it is the the single the single most important focus of everyone around the exact team table, and I know I know board colleagues share that 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 the importance of that work. So, you know, I'm I'm confident that over the next um, the next the next few weeks we will start to put in place some really significant changes which are going to or well in some respects they are significant changes in the sense the impact they're going to have they are not necessarily a significant change to the system just to stress that it's about looking at things which maybe haven't worked in the way they should have done and I also think that um, that the providers will also start to see a, a, a significant uptick in in things like the, the ability to do things on the portal we're already starting to see that coming through but I know Mark will probably want to talk about that in a minute but I think each day we are putting in small fixes uh, but then there, and there's, a, there's some pieces of work which is being done with colleagues and I think that's a really important point to stress that you know a lot of a lot of the the, the slightly bigger changes are being done as, as part of a co-design process with colleagues uh, so that they, their voice is, is embedded in any changes we're, we're making, which is, is really important. So um, so I think, I, thank you. I think I'm, I'm sure colleagues will appreciate the, the sentiment you expressed. Thank you. Uh, Charmin, I think you were going to comment. Chris, you had a hand up as well. Let's start with Charmin. Thanks. Um, I'm just building a little bit on uh, Stephen's comment earlier. I'm just wondering, we, we have seen a lot from colleagues at many conferences. A lot of us have sat on calls and I wondered, given how stressful this has been for colleagues, both in terms of you know, some of our IT colleagues, in terms of volume of work, our operations colleagues, in terms of new ways of working that haven't necessarily fallen right, what are we doing to offer them support for well-being? 
that's my first question, and I guess um, what would be really uh, useful to understand is you've sort of talked a little about timing. It's sort of a bit of a view on co-creation versus decision-making <coughs> timelines, because I think there is that balance, isn't there, between wanting to hear from colleagues as to how we resolve, but also colleagues desperately wanting decisions. So just a bit on that would be great. Can I point to Kate to do the well-being, the well-being question, and then I'll come in on the um, on the decision-making question. Thanks, uh, Charmian. So as you say, a number of us have been at operational conferences across the country over the last a month or so, and we spent time with colleagues asking them what would make their lives easier in work in, in six months' time and therefore support their well-being. And we've got some really clear messages that have come from that. We'd heard it through the people survey, but this really solidified what people want to see. And it's issues around the assessor and inspector ways of working, the relationship manager, the technology, the methodology, and also how we've established these teams. So the kind of challenge of around some specialist colleagues not feeling like they've got the kind of infrastructure and support around them. So, um, so we've got real clarity about what people need to improve their well-being. There were already some actions in train to address that, but now we've got a real, 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 real clear view in what order to be addressing it. We will now uh, be communicating much more frequently with people about what we're doing in response to that. So I think, I think the most important thing we can do to support people's well-being is to show that we're listening and then doing something with that feedback which they've given us now loudly and clearly. Um we do have a suite of offers around well-being that have been in place for, for a, a, a while that colleagues are um, you know, I'm, I'm confident that they would be clear how to access through our um, intranet when it comes to uh, employee support and obviously in regular conversations one-to-ones with their, their line managers as well. Um, so, and, and we're particularly aware, as I say, it's been a, 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 a difficult time for our colleagues in operation, so that extra support that operational managers have been providing. And, and again, when we look at our people survey, um, we have had positive feedback about the support colleagues have got from their, their line managers on the front on the front line as well. So those two things, I think it's about reminding colleagues of the support that is there and signposting them to that. But I think the most critical thing we can do as an exec team is all this time and investment colleagues have taken to tell us what they need to see change, to demonstrate that that change has happened and to let people know that a lot of it is happening in response to what they've told us as well. And just my final comment would be actually what some of our colleagues want to see changed are a couple of the kind of key things that we know our providers want as well. So we know our providers want to see something meaningful when it comes to relationship management. They want to have a smoother experience when interacting with us um, uh, through our, our systems as well. So in addressing what our colleagues want, we're also addressing um, some of the key issues from our providers. I know there are other questions, and Chris, you wanted to come in, but I can see Hannah's hands up. I suspect she's wanted to come in on this. So, Hannah, let me come to you first, and then we'll uh, come to the <coughs> pardon me, come to others in the room. Thank you. Um, I really, it's lovely to hear all the work that's going in and all the thought that's being put in around supporting our people and um, the recognition that it has been a really difficult time. It feels like we've had change upon change upon change with you know the the pandemic and, and systems and structure changes and actually I think what we hear in the networks is people are sort of changed out you know they need time to settle and that stability to kind of settle into new ways of working with that support of being heard um, when they raise issues and that action being changed um, action being taken sorry and um, we just need to give people a bit of breathing space and time to adjust with that sort of wrapper of support around it so it's really wonderful to hear that people's feedback is being listened to and, and action sort of planning happening um, and just just a plea really for, for a bit of stability yes fix the issues um, that we've talked about but also just give people a bit of breathing space to to get used to the new ways of working. Thanks, uh, Hannah. And it, it echoes the message we, we have from other sources. I mean, we appreciate from the board's point of view, we're trying to get a sensible balance between people that want things done yesterday or the day before yesterday. And uh, uh, an understandable desire, we're all human beings, none of us like change as a basic premise. Uh, and getting that balance right, I think, is one of the biggest challenges for, for the board. Um, can I Ian, do you want to go? Can I, can I just come in on, on just picking up on Charmian's second point, and I think linking it to what Hannah's just said. You know, my ambition is to is that we we fix the things that need fixing, and, and we can debate the definition of fix versus enhance, and, and it, that's probably a slightly un, unhelpful conversation. But but we can fix the things that need fixing, um, both for providers and for colleagues internally. But then I think we then then that's the point at which we kind of we then start to say right. 
having used the system, you know, our providers asking us for a new a new feature, our, our colleagues internally asking us for a new feature. If that is the case, then we can start to think about building that. But the, but but sort of job one is is make the system as smooth as possible internally and externally, uh, and to, therefore to make it as effective as possible. Um, you know, and and the same with uh, with when we look at. Uh, job roles and and indeed policy. There was no ambition to start to massively change those things in terms of a change program, but it is about addressing though where people are saying, look, this doesn't work or that doesn't work or wouldn't it be better if, then it, if people who are working in the system are are asking for change, then then address that constructively. But I think 100% agree with you, Hannah, that um, that that it's it, it's not something we want to do. But I, I think to Charmian's point, I, I think I am really keen that that we if we can just fix something because it, a form doesn't work and it needs us it needs a field moving which is the sort of level of 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 thing that we're doing in some places we should just do that but equally we should create the space for where things do need co-designing we create you know we we we, we give ourselves a couple of weeks to to give to get an extra couple of weeks in order to do exactly that i know mark will want to talk about some of the work he's doing in a minute on exactly that topic so i think there's the, you're absolutely spot on it's a question of giving ourselves a little bit of time but not letting an issue run ad infinitum so uh, but because we have we have now got i think a good mechanism for getting getting colleagues into the mix more frequently than, than maybe we ha had done before. That's not to say that colleagues weren't involved in, in co-design in the first place because they, they, they were, so yeah, thank you. So Chris and Mark, if, keep it brief if you could. Chris, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. So just to build on <clears throat> Stephen's original point and the, and the comments that have been made, um, this is, I think that we, we owe thanks to both colleagues and to providers in the way that they've engaged with us as we've launched um, the, 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 new, the new approach and the, and the technology around it. I think the, the challenge for us is to make sure we've heard the insight that we've got from uh, and turned it into action, as you, as you talked about, Ian. I think there's some things that are, in a sense, relatively easy and binary to fix. There are some things that we need to consider what the right solution looks like. <clears throat> One of the things that we've heard from both colleagues and providers is some things that are quick, but where there is a consideration of what to do making sure people are involved in the journey, both internally and externally. And I think part of our challenge is to make sure that we are involving people in the development and the testing of new approaches that we, that we take. And there's ongoing support for both uh, for colleagues and providers. And then lastly, just in terms of the, 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 the way in which we communicate this internally and externally, I'd be very grateful for <clears throat> colleagues that, that work internally and also organizations that are represented externally for supporting the the, the the development of the communications around the, the sort of insight into action work so that they can help us um, make sure that works well and that we can get further feedback on how the messages are landing internally and externally that will be really important not just for the next few weeks but as we build confidence and trust and develop the longer term solutions that we've talked about earlier Mark. Thank you. Um, so I, I want to echo Stephen's comments and, and about thanking colleagues for the, the enormous hard work they've done in, in, in adopting new systems and new ways of working, and particularly colleagues across the, the change functions who worked incredibly hard, tirelessly, often weekends and late into the evening, supporting the change work that we're doing. At the moment, there are, there are a number of key areas that we are uh, supporting change in specifically focused on registration, on contact, on streamlining of assessment, portal work and some performance um, issues. And we're working really closely with our colleagues in different sectors, in different regions to make sure we get a balanced view and feedback. And there, there is real co-design going on at the moment. Just to give some colleagues some, um, some insight into some of the things that are coming. Um, uh, some of these things are at various different stages. And as Ian says, some of these take a little bit longer to design and we should take the time to, to um, make sure we get full colleague input into making sure that those things are when we deliver them are the things that make a difference for people. Um, some things we'll deliver very soon so for example the ability for colleagues to see everything on an assessment once it's closed that might seem like a, a small thing but actually that's a, that's a big deal for colleagues. Um, others will be more dramatic ability for, for us to be able to significantly streamline the evidence process when we're uploading evidence and um, uh, the ability for us to, um, to to do a lot of that in one place rather than the system having to, to, to do many 
uh, many activities. And the big one around, around um, assessment review process, which I know colleagues find uh, particularly onerous at the moment, for us to have that reduced down to a single page where colleagues can review things by exception. It's a, it's a, it's a leaning of the, of the process and a, and a, a real kind of user, re user research centred design, which at the moment has lots of colleagues from across the organisation, as I said, from different parts of the organisation, really embedded in that design process. And I'm, I'm excited for colleagues to be able to see that once that, um, once that comes to fruition, and I think that'll make a big difference. So, make this last couple of comments, I think. Christian, I think you had a question, and Joyce, did you want to come in as well? So, Christian and then Joyce. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to, uh, Chris may have started to ask this, answer this question. I wanted to find out a bit more about the Insights into Action Group, um, and particularly what's its membership, and how are the channels of communication working both ways? So how are you consulting with external and internal groups, and how are you communicating what's happening? Not quite sure who will answer that. Insight into Action is an internal group that I chair, which contains the uh, the exec team plus a number of other other people who are involved in direct delivery of, of particular work streams. We've, we've divided the work, the short term work, up into a series of work streams, and we have a, a oversight on a weekly basis of kind of what was delivered last week, what's being delivered next week, and the meeting begins with a what what are we hearing from providers, what are we hearing from from uh, from our colleagues internally, and then then we work through the specific action. So it's an action tracking group, if 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 you will, uh, and then at the end of that, we then work out whether we need to change our overall communications plan, both externally and internally. So. So, so decisions are being communicated back to those groups. How? So um, we use the start of the meeting to talk about the new insight we're getting. We talk about, as, uh, as uh, Kate said, there are sort of four or five areas of work that we're particularly focused on. And at the end, of the end of the meeting, we agree, therefore, what are the messages for now and what are the actions for next? Then we take that away and test that with both with, uh, with colleagues internally and also with uh, providers and provider representative groups externally before we then uh, uh, update the, the communication. It goes differently to different groups. It might uh, what we send to to managers and colleagues internally might have a flavour slightly different to what we talk to providers about, but essentially built on that core script of what are we doing this week, what what are the plans for the next week and the following week. So people get a, hopefully a drumbeat of things that we're trying to make changes on. Uh, I might come back. I have a choice. We do need to move on, Tyson. So, by all means, comment, then Joyce, and then we'll have to close it down. Well, sorry to um, sorry to jump ahead, of you, Joyce. I just wanted to um, add to what um, what Chris said. Um, first of all, to to also um, underline what Stephen said about the incredible commitment of all, all my colleagues over over what's been a really challenging period. Thank you. Um, we've also developed Christine in the operations hub a you said we heard we did <coughs> mechanism, which is an actual live SharePoint site where we are taking all of the feedback we are getting, including from the operational um, conferences, and giving people in real time feedback on what we do. Doing with the, with the, the information we've given uh, given them, I think that will really help to give colleagues a sense of what what we're doing with their with their with their feedback and with their concerns. Thanks, Tyson. Joyce wanted to come. On. Sorry, thank you. Um, so I wanted to say thank you to um, the actions and the commitment that our colleagues have demonstrated. I also wanted to say sorry, actually, that it's been such a challenging time. And we are asking people to balance hardship and hope. So I just wanted to mention that we talked earlier about lots of people want us to do things really quickly, but we also want to be evidence-based and also want to co-design because doing things with people in consultation with people is also really in, important. So I think there are lots of activities going on, but we've got to give people an understanding of what's our plan clarity of what do we want to achieve and by when and to keep people up to date within that plan in terms of our communications and our communications are really important first of all it's like the free h's to me people want to be helped let's sort out the problems that people have they also want to be hugged let's speak to the emotions that people said that they are feeling now um, and try and improve uh, where people are 
and people want to be heard. So just to Tyson's point that you said we've heard is really important, but we really got to hear and we've got to feed back uh, in terms of our understanding what people have said to us so that they know then that they've been heard. So we are thinking about the different types of communications that's really going to be important to take people through this process because it's an endurance um, and it's challenging and we, we just need to really support people through that. Okay, thanks, Joyce. Uh, perhaps we've enjoyed the discussion then, but I mean, firstly, thank Ian for, for, for the summary, and I think there's a lot of recognition. I uh, hope people listening understand that the board has got the message about the challenges it's created both externally and internally. Uh, so, to risk of repeating thanks to providers for sticking with us, but also for those who volunteered to help us do some of the pilots, that is appreciated. Uh, <clears throat> colleagues internally, I think one of the most common questions is do you really understand the impact? And I would, I would like to think today we do. Uh, nobody shunned any illusion. There is a vast amount of work going on. The challenge, really building what Joyce said, is to make sure that people understand uh, that, but more importantly, what it means for them and they can see where the improvements are going to come and over what, what time frame. And we've got that message, uh, I think, fairly clearly. So it's something the board needs to do. But thank you very much indeed, B, for that um, hugely important and priority for the board. If I could move on, um, the uh, reporting update, Kate and Chris, I'll hand this over to you. This is seems odd to be talking to us of Q4, but the back end of the last financial year. Uh, so over to you. Uh, thank you. So I'm um, pleased to present to board um, the performance reporting for end of um, quarter four of the last financial year. And in your summary sheet, you'll see that we've drawn out some key performance areas that we might wish to discuss today, along with some changes when it comes to risks. So some new risks and risks that have changed in terms of action that we've taken. So um, unless Chris or Steph have anything particular we want to draw out, do you want to, uh, I'll hand over to Chris now for just some, a uh, couple of key reflections, then we'll go to questions. So Chris. Thanks, Kate. Um, I'll just uh, just summarise what's in the text. This is, as I said, last uh, uh, position of 23-24. We've got a later item on business plan for, for, for next year, which will have uh, a new set of measures and a, and a performance deck to support that. But um, just in terms of summaries, there's, there's um, a, a lot of areas uh, where we, 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 we've shown green, we've, we've, we've met our targets, um, uh, but there's, there's probably three areas that I pull out as standing out as an area of discussion, similar to areas I've pulled out in previous months and, and probably been the story of the year. Um, just to run through them, uh, the first one would be safeguarding alerts and whistleblowing. Um, just a bit of context to this, we had a previous measure that brought together all whistleblowing with a 95% target. And what we've tried to do this year is break that out based on priority to... A, give a bit of, uh, more focus and a bit more transparency. Um, for the priority ones, we kept the target at 95%. I think you can see from the deck we've struggled to achieve that throughout the year. We've struggled to achieve that 95% aspiration. We have uh, responded to the whistleblowings. It's just we haven't done it in the, in the one-day target that we've, we've set ourselves in in all of those cases. Uh, more generally, uh, along uh, for sake on whistleblowing, performance dipped in the year. Uh, as we launched our new contact service uh, in, in, in quarter two, uh, which has impacted the, kind of the year, uh, year KPIs. And performance it continues to be monitored closely for safeguarding uh, whistleblowing. Uh, another area I'd pull out would be NCSE response times. We track four types of call, uh, and you can see from, from the, uh, the, the, the dashboard summary that all bar general inquiries are just short of the target. Um, <coughs> Performance has been largely unchanged from, uh, from the previous quarter. And again, we've had challenges uh, as a transitional period of our regulatory platform and year, but also resourcing challenges in the centre. Again, res response times continues to be tracked closely, weekly, internally. Uh, so we track through that and you can see that performance is uh, in, in improving in, in most areas based on live data. The last one to pull out would be registration timeliness. Um, currently, 54% of our re registration applications are over 10 weeks old. Uh, which is an increase from last financial year and the previous quarter. Um, we've, we continue to see an increase in volume of applications coming in to CQC. Um, that's left resourcing challenges. We've addressed those resourcing challenges. I think what's worth noting is whilst the uh, age of our applications increases and the volume coming in is increasing, the overall volume of applications in the system is, has gone down in recent months. 
Uh, so an area of, uh, of an improvement there, but continue to, to focus on registration incredibly f uh, closely. Um, lastly, on the, on the finances, uh, we finished the year uh, with a 0.5 million surplus against our budget, um, which uh, was an improvement on the previous forecast we had. Uh, that is made up of a, um, a favourable var uh, income, uh, fav favourable variance on our uh, fee income uh, of 2.1 million, which is largely due to uh, small variations in what we plan to bill based on a register versus what we've actually billed in year based on the actual register, and a deficit on our grant and aid uh, of 1.6 million, which is uh, in, well entirely down to our response to the COVID inquiry which we have not had uh, any funding for and is currently unfunded. Uh, and a capital budget uh, end of the year with 300k underspent for the year. So I'll, I'll pause there and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chris. Questions, Chris. Belinda. Thanks, Chris. Um, so you're right to point out about the whistleblowing, the priority ones, you know, just deteriorating through the year, really. But I wondered if you had a feel for, you know, if they're not getting heard within 24 hours, how long are they actually taking? And also, how are we, you know, what steps are we taking to improve, to improve that to get back to target? I'll take that if that's all right, Belinda. So um, we are delivering against our old KPI, which was around 95% within five days. It's just the one day and three day that we are meeting. So when we look at that delivery overall, we are seeing that we're um, hitting the majority of whistleblowing within the five days and um, all remaining have action within a two week period. So it's just the timeliness within the one days and the three days. We do do exception reporting internally as an organization to look at any that fall beyond that period and just to flag them up in case that's been a kind of recording, a mission or anything like that. Thanks, Steph. And steps to get back on track. Um, there's a programme of work being led from a colleague within regulatory leadership, which will include sort of de de development and support for, for um, people working in operations. Um, it's quite, quite a comprehensive programme, which maybe we can discuss at a future board meeting. Okay. Chris, sorry. I just wanted to say that the, um, as ever with these figures, they they probably don't play to the effort that the NCSC colleagues in national operation colleagues are going to to manage what is you just talked about the the issues around um, uh, the, the, the some of the, the challenges of the introduction of the new approach. There's there's a lot that sits behind these figures about people working very hard to try and manage the volumes of, of activities, both in terms of uh, information that, uh, that they're receiving, uh, whistleblowing and, and, and elsewhere registrations, but also the conversations and, and the, the information that's coming through on the National Inquiry's line. So I just want to say, to, particularly to those colleagues, that there's, there's a, um, to thank them for, their, for their, um, the way in which they've approached their work, because it's, um, it, it, it's, it's been an important part of our response to providers and to the public. Charmin. Thanks. I just uh, want to compliment the team on the work because I think what we've got now is a really great degree of transparency which makes it uh, very useful for us to have some very meaningful conversations. Um, and I'm really keen as we go forward, as we've discussed, to sort of look at the so what and then to the points that have just been made. How do we uh, move back uh, to sort of looking at what corrective actions are required? Um, likewise, I was just interested in relation to uh, metrics such as the portion of services requiring enforcement following uh, regulatory activity or the percentage of services requiring action after first assessment. How are we looking at those in terms of lessons learned to factor back into sort of the initial processes? I'm not sure it's one for you, Steph. Sorry, I was just going to answer Charmian initially and then hand over to Tyson. So in terms of the way that we review that from a performance perspective, naturally we can't create targets around that because of uh, perverse incentives. But what we do look at is where there's variance, so regional variance, um, sector type variance, and we do monitor them for the volume of applications that result in breaches or impact. Um, what we will have the functionality to do in our new platform, which we weren't able to do previously, was get to a lot more granular 
granular detail of the types of breaches and the types of activity that we'll be taking. So we'll then be able to look at more information around any statistical variance of is it safe care or is it good governance and staffing, things like that. So we can start to look at those kind of patterns. But Tyson and his team um, look at that data more regular in terms of reactive approach as well as performance. I mean, thank you, Steph. The only thing I would add is that we, we, do, we do look particularly at regional variations and then map that against our, our, our risk, risk factors. And um, if we're seeing more, more enforcement um, than we would expect, then we, we would want to look into that. This is an area where I think consistency is important. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Sure, I mean, if you could turn your mic off. Uh, Stephen. Um, Again, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Steph. I think this is a really good report, and it, it gives us much better insight than I think we've we've had in the past about performance. Um, but of course, that then brings the consequence that uh, it allows us to spot where performance really needs to be uh, sort of interrogated. Uh, and I'm looking particularly at page 29 of the pack and the inspection and assessments graph. Because for me, this is the organization's core business, the, 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 the generation, the whole pipeline of inspection and assessments and, and the reports that go with them. And I think as a board, we can't be happy with the latest reported actual and the trend that it's showing. Now, we are where we are because of what we were discussing under the previous item about you know being in a transition phase of everybody getting used to new ways of working and that inevitably slows people down. But I do think we'll need to keep on top of that particular metric because currently performance is not where it needs to be and by quite a long way. So we need to see that turning back up again as a result of all of the work we were talking about previously in helping colleagues get to the point where they can efficiently, effectively, swiftly, you know, uh, move through the whole pipeline of, of generating uh, valid and professionally informed reports and assessments. We want to respond to that, shall we go straight to Mark? Mark, you pick up your comment and then if there's any management response. Uh, Mark, mine was just an, an addition to that, which is massive benefit of having that transparency. Um, at the moment, quite correctly, this is positioned as looking backwards across the year that's just gone by. We need to turn that into a prospective view, including particularly a focus areas on those hot spots where improvement is required and required quickly, and seeing what we're anticipating month to month or quarter to quarter uh, with, with a, a, an ability to hold ourselves to account when we are not meeting projections that we hope to meet what interventions are we taking to make sure that we are actually uh, continuing to accelerate in the right direction and, and be open to continue to make those changes as needed? Yeah, do you want to pick that up or Tyson? Shall I, I'll, I'll, I'll start, shall I? I mean, um, Steph can come in with, with, with the figures as the, as the owner of the data. Um, but I think that over, over the last few weeks, we are starting to see quite a good uplift in the amount of assessment assessment activity that the teams are doing. Um, I think that's sort of right across the, 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 the different areas of assessment, including publishing reports. And I think that is um, still 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 very early days and still very small green shoots um, from the point of view of what you've been discussing. But I think that's starting to show, I hope, uh, a, a good direction of travel. You're absolutely right, Mark. We do, we do have, um, we have an overall target for, for the year at a national level. We um, can work that out by quarter by quarter, and Steph is monitoring where we are for, for quarter one. But that, that uplift, if it continues, I think we'll, we'll start to see us doing more assessments than, than we did last year. Um, but we will be able to update the board on a, on a regular basis. Although if I could just add, I mean, I think if people are transitioning from one way of working to another, there's inevitably a slowdown as people lack familiarity. So it is inevitable that people become more familiar that things will start to get better. What I think is important we understand is, I mean, there's a finite life to that. <laughs> you, know, you just become more familiar, but at that stage, impediments kick in, uh, which brings us back to the sort of things Ian was talking about earlier on. So I think in terms of projections, we need to be clear. We don't just extrapolate the benefits of learning so far because that could plateau quite quickly. We need to understand what needs to happen 
more structurally to enable people to uh, achieve a higher level. So I'm stating the obvious, but I think it's important that in plans to do that, and also uh, for the benefit of our of our um, colleagues, who I know many will listen to this call, that we um, we understand that. Um, Mark, you want to come in? Yeah, thank thanks. And thank you, Steph and, and and Chris for for this, which is just a level of transparency that is is terrific. Uh, and enormously helpful, and I'll, and thank you also for your help in supporting the information that we see at RGC, because I, I I think um, you know we're getting we're getting there uh, in relation to 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 RGC. One common area of ground is on page thirty eight of the pack, and it's the you know as if we didn't have enough to do. We've 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 also accepted. 245 recommendations from other people about how we could do better um, because these are recommendations that we've reviewed and decided to accept we do need to track them through to to completion um, I, I think we've got the same problem with this with the metric as presented here as as the equivalent metric we see at RGC in that it talks about progress whereas actually it's quite hard to understand whether we're really on track in relation to this because obviously those 245 are prioritized and some of them we quite deliberately will not have started yet so if if we can try and get a lens on this which is more about well where did we think we were going to be and where are we in relation to the 245 that would be enormously helpful thank you although i think we important to add that uh, we treat with respect people who uh, suggestions made as what we could do, but uh, it's also true that not all of them we can do. Sometimes people recommend things that are beyond our powers, don't they? So important part of this is making sure that we are identifying what we can and can't do, as well as then managing how we progress against what we can do. Yeah, these are the ones that we've accepted. So these are the ones which we reviewed and said, yes, we should do that. So, um, but. They have various degrees of priority, so we just and it's reflecting that priority. I think that we need to try and do here. Steph, you want to? So just to provide some clarity on that, so we do have two hundred and fifty-four, uh, two hundred and forty-five. Sorry, those two hundred and forty-five are both external recommendations and internal, and they're previous publications where we've um, committed to changing our methodology. So some of them are like out of sight, who cares, and things like that, where we've committed to change. And part of single assessment framework is around that and about kind of changing our methodology. And um, what we can do moving forward is split this up because it's made of those it's made of three camps it's where we've published documents the listening learning responding review and then those recommendations that we've had from external sources where we need to change our um, methodology to support there is a number of those whereby um, they're with partnerships and external agencies where they're not progressing to a point that we can deliver them as of yet so I think we need to be more transparent in this reporting mark and I think uh, I think it's a really valid point to make because actually we may be far from target because that's the furthest we can get at the moment and I think we need to provide that transparency in this reporting so that you have sight of that and therefore the, the questions can be on the ones that we can progress and, and potentially have um, prioritised other things in addition to that. James, you wanted to come in earlier. Thank you, pardon. Um, I just had a, a final uh, codicil to what um, Steph was saying there around the recommendations. We do, we do have a, a dashboard and a report, and regulatory leadership team uh, do delve into the detail of what, what where performance is at in terms of where we're taking action on recommendations with accepted, but also ones that are, as it were, parked or queued for further work. So there, there is more detail. If the board would find it helpful, we could uh, supply that, certainly. I wanted to make the broader point about... Um, of course, the, the, this report is really helpful. It gives us the transparency on the numbers. And as Tyson was alluding to earlier, there's an issue of quality, the quality of the work that we're doing, as well as the number of assessments that we're doing. And so there is action underway in particular areas, for example, on the safeguarding or information of concern and the standard operating procedure. So we're, we, we both need to look at the in, impact and the quality of the work we're doing, as well as just tracking these numbers, because behind the numbers there are issues around uh, you know how good is the work that we're doing so um, regulatory leadership have got a key role alongside uh, operations and policy colleagues in doing that thank you 
Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any other last questions or, or move on? Well, look, if there are no more questions, can I just uh, repeat uh, something I think certainly Stephen said and maybe others? Thanks for the, the way you've continued to develop the reporting, uh, even accepting the consequence that the more you give us, the more questions we ask. But, but Stephen did not mean to interpret we want to go back to the old ways. Uh, but it is really helpful. And the other things, but especially stating the obvious, the, the data is helpful, but we have been asking that if there's something that's odd, you comment on it, and more importantly, what you're doing about it, because if it's clear that you're on the case and doing something with it, I, I don't think we need to spend too much time with the board. So you know, I think we're progressively being able to spend a little bit less time on this, simply because uh, we're discharging obligations by saying you've identified the problem and have a plan. Nevertheless, of course, there are always questions that we bring. But thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Steph. Um, let's uh, keep moving on then, if we could. Joyce, I think probably over to you. I don't know if uh, uh, Becky's joining us. Hello, Becky. Um, the, um, of course, have the Cabinet Office Review. There is a brief paper in the pack. Uh, take that as read. I mean, it is what it is, but you might want to give us some additional comments, and then we'll see if colleagues around the board table have any questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you, um, Ian. The paper just points to uh, the Cabinet Office and uh, Department of Health and Social Care review which was launched in May and the chair of that review is Dr Penny Dash. Um, we have said that this is part of the Cabinet Office public uh, body review programme and the aim of the review is to um, look at the, the duties that are given to us as a regulator and also then how we fulfil those duties. Um, it covers definitely our civil assessment framework but it also looks at our leadership uh, uh, and staffing for our new regulations on uh, local authority and ICS assessment, how we use uh, people's voices uh, in our assessment and our work, our work with partners, uh, for example, NHS England, and the impact of our work on providers, as in do we drive improvement, do we encourage providers to do the right thing, are we focused on innovation and productivity, and are we ourselves uh, prepared in terms of digital healthcare and the data and metrics we use um, around that. Um, if I just point uh, in terms of our approach, I, I, I think and we have said that we do welcome this review. Um, independent assessment as a public body is very important to provide assurance about the effectiveness of our work and our approach. We have just talked earlier about this review has come at a time of significant change, um, a transformational change as an organisation. Um, the review is not asking questions that we're not asking of ourselves and, and actions that we're not taking of ourselves, but we do see it as a, a really good opportunity to understand where we are in terms of uh, the regulation that we do, but also to learn and, in, and improve. Uh, it has just started, so if there are questions about, which are far more detailed, I probably won't be able to answer, um, uh, having just spoken to Penny Dash on Monday of this week. Stating the obvious, this is a private review, so you know, yeah. we, we cannot control or even probably have much influence over what the chair uh, will ultimately write, but uh, important the board are made aware of, of where we are. So, uh, any questions? Christine. Thank you. Um, I just thought that, that I have seen quite a lot of comments externally, particularly from people who, who see this as a, um, a reactive um, inquiry as a result of the transformation agenda. And I just wanted to clarify, is that the case or is it part of a, a programme of, of public bodies being reviewed? So from what we are aware, this is part of the programme of the Cabinet Office Public Reviews Bodies. There are 30 others going on uh, this year and, and we are part of that. And it's a spon what our sponsorship is the Department of Health, which is why it's a Cabinet Office and Department Review. Just had that as a statement of fact, we became aware of the intention to do this and had initial discussions about the prospect of it before SAF was rolled out. So you're right, I think there's been a number of uh, media commentary, some of which is probably ill-informed. Now, ultimately, the chair will decide, but it seems to me that you, well, we should either tend to look at this in really two blocks, which, which were touched on the papers. You know, If we're looking at how effective a CQC, one block is what are we being asked to do? Do we have the right regulations, the right powers, all that kind of stuff? And, and that any recommendations coming out are, are not for us. Uh, we may have a view on them, but they're not for us. The other bit is, given those regulations, how effective are we? of which SAF is clearly a component part, uh, but recognising that SAF is literally only in the, the process of being rolled out. The vast majority of proud providers have not seen SAF yet, so I'm sure the chair will look at SAF and what it's rolling out, but 
the evidence that's available on our effectiveness is largely due on, uh, available from, from what we did before. I mean, if not, uh, I mean, it's not surprising there aren't, because I say this is an independent review and we don't control that, I think, so um, no point in, in speculating. To the extent that we can, we'll keep the board updated, but, but again, um, I don't know how much feedback we'll get from the chair in any event. You know, it, it, it's, it's up to her to report, not for us to report publicly. So we'll do our best to keep people informed. Um, if you hear any other observations outside, you know, as to what's going on, please do let us know. But equally, I think, Christine, to your question, um, hopefully that's a helpful response, because I think there has been some other helpful reporting. Okay, well, Becky, thank you very much indeed for coming in uh, briefly. And nice to see you again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, Joyce, thank you for dealing with that. Um, Moving on again, we have, um, it's down to note, but we need to make, I hope we haven't got it formally for approval, but need to make sure we're happy with the equity, diversity and inclusion strategy. So Kate, I think this is yours, but we're going to be joined by Jackie, hopefully. I hope so, because um, I'd like to address some of this to them. Are they, They're walking into the room, so I will just feel for two seconds as um, Jackie Jackson, our Director for People and Culture, and Nadia Rahman uh, join us. So, um, colleagues, I'm really um, proud to um, uh, present this paper to you today, which is our uh, proposed equality, diversity and inclusion strategy for 24 to 27. Um, this has been quite a long time in the making, and the reason why it's been a long time in the making is the amount of work that Nadia has done with externally but internally with uh, Equality Networks and many, many other people to uh, ensure that we came up with a strategy that was suitably ambitious, but also boiled down everything we wanted to do to kind of three concrete priorities with clear deliverables and then a kind of plat time frame about when that is going to um when that's going to be delivered by. So I wanted, uh, first of all, to say thank you to all our colleagues who have been involved. But before I hand over to Jackie and Nadia, I just want to say a personal um, shout out to Nadia and her leadership on this uh, piece of work, because I hope, and we'll see what our, our, our board colleagues think, but um, I, I hope it's a piece of work that we can feel really positive about getting behind. Talks about things such as belonging. Uh, and the final thing I'd say is um, uh, the uh, format of this uh, uh, hopefully feels really accessible. Uh, but we also have it in a number of different versions that, again, Nadia will talk to, to make this a uh, document that everyone can uh, engage with and, and uh, you know, is, is able to use. But without further ado, I'll hand over to Jackie. Actually, before we do that, my apologies, Nadia. I, I said we were due to be joined by Jackie, and I introduced Jackie, and I didn't introduce you because your name was on the next page. So my apologies for that. For those watching online, and Nadia has joined us as well. So over to you. Yeah, thanks, Kate. Uh, just to build on that, I would just take, like, like to take the opportunity publicly um, to thank a number of colleagues and external stakeholders who have given of their time generously to help with the production of the strategy and worked with Nadia and Karis and my wider people team really to bring us to um, the publication we've got in front of you. So Equality Network chairs and members for their advocacy and leadership in th this work, trade union colleagues, equity, diversity, inclusion coordinators who are going to be absolutely integral in how we take this strategy forward and um, live and breathe it um, in the organisation. Data and insight colleagues, colleagues around this table, Namali for being sponsor and Joyce for your invaluable contribution. This has been a really collaborative approach and I think that really bodes well and pr provides really sure foundation about actually what happens next, because this isn't, isn't a standalone piece of work. This should be in everything we do, everything we consider, and actually it isn't a bolt on. This is, this is who we are, and this is about belonging. So with that in mind, I think it's worth to say this isn't about additional resources needing or colleagues feeling overburdened by this. This is about recognising the links that this strategy will give us. So our inclusive leadership pathway, our talent management, how we recruit, how we support and develop colleagues. All of this has an integral part in the talk to each other on a relationship basis. And, you know, I could go on for a long time with all of the work programmes that actually, actually um, talk to the strategy and they will sustain each other. 
Um, I want to give some assurance in terms of resource. This is in my work programme in the People Directorate in terms of how we support, guide, challenge, hold to account. What we don't do is exclusively own this. This is for everybody to own and be proud of and take responsibility, whatever role we have in the organisation, to bring this to life and um, make, it, make, it, make ourselves proud and also be um, employer of choice. Um, that people want to come and work with us when they see us living this. So I think that is all I want to say. I'm absolutely passionate and believe in everything we have in this strategy. Um, I'm compelling the organisation to get behind it, own it and work with us. Um, and I know, Nadia, you've got a couple of things to say. And just to echo Kate's, Nadia and Karis and my people team have been absolutely phenomenal and I am really proud of everything they've done to get us to this. So thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I just have a couple of points. We acknowledge the plan is comprehensive and there's a lot of activity in there, but for assurance, a lot of activity is underway already and then we will use a phased approach agreed with key stakeholders so we can build on that activity. So for example, the recruitment review is already underway and that speaks to one of our key priorities. We will build on that later this year once the recommendations come through from the external consultant company. We've already started work to support our activity on bullying, harassment and discrimination. So, for example, the Successful Manager Programme was launched earlier this year. That will be iterative. It will equip leaders to have those conversations on inclusion with wider skills, like in terms of interpersonal skills. There's also our work on culture and values that you're aware of. That creates the foundations for the activity on bullying, harassment and discrimination, any targeted interventions to actually succeed. There's also work underway that leaders are aware of on talent in terms of career conversations. That speaks to another priority within the strategy. So you will see that there's activity already underway that has a thread of inclusion throughout it. It's such a priority for the People Directorate that it's woven through all of the key priorities that we are working on from a, for, from a number of teams and we want to bring that all in one place so it's focused for everyone in the strategy so they can see that it touches all of the work that we do. Another specific example of activity that's already underway and there'll be a phased approach is our learning on race. So the LLRC recommended that it was academically based, it was evidence based and we should start as a priority with our leaders and you've been a part of that so we have started that with our board and executive team. We will continue that this year by rolling it out for wider colleagues and we'll use a learning needs analysis to support that so it's tailored for individuals and we will aim to ensure that it's aligned to what we've started for our executive team and our board. Um, to build on Jackie's point on governance. So it's important that we have these committees and that we are transparent using these platforms to share updates with our colleagues. But what we learned, yes, last year with our engagement is a part of our governance or a significant part of our governance is to be accountable to our colleagues. And one way that we will do that is to work with our valuable equality networks, our trade union representatives, our equity, diversity and inclusion coordinators and our leaders to share our progress regularly and gain their feedback regularly as well. So if we do need to change tack, if we do need to change our approach based on what people feel, then we do that and they feel part of the journey because that's very important to them that it's not a paper written by me or Jackie from a corporate perspective. They have shaped the way that we feel inclusion at CQC. That was very important for them and we want to listen to that feedback and make sure that we do that throughout the course of our strategy over the next three years. We'll start to do that as part of our engagement plan for embedding the strategy. We will go back, close the loop, explain to them how their contributions from last year have been incorporated into the strategy 
hopefully that gives them reassurance that we have listened and we do listen and we will continue that dialogue with them. We'll use feedback from those sessions to tailor directorate to directorate. How do they want to hear about future updates? Is recruitment more of a priority? We'll come back and give you more of a comprehensive update following the recruitment review, for example. So we will work with our internal engagement colleagues to make sure that engagement plan is more than our publication of the of the strategy documents, which is very important, but you know, they really want us to go back and speak to them and be transparent, and we will make sure that we do that. As Kate mentioned, there are a, a, a few versions that will be available and that's to ensure accessibility for all. So there will be a word version and an audio format version in addition to perhaps a little bit more of a colourful version and we have engaged with our assistive technology and accessibility lead, the business disability forum, our equality networks and our equity diversity and inclusion coordinators to make sure that the products are accessible for everyone because that is a key priority for us, accessibility, mm -hmm. inclusion, people need to feel that they can access the CQC and um, so it you know goes to the heart of the of the strategy and what we want to build at CQC in terms of inclusion so I hope people are able to read the strategy and we hope our leaders will provide them protected time as part of the learning and development priority that we have in investing in our colleagues so they have time to really digest the strategy, have time to reflect on it, and they can understand how they can support us to deliver the strategy. Okay, many thanks, Nadia. Uh, I mean, look, it's, it's clearly a huge amount of work has gone into it. Uh, it. Seems pretty comprehensive and cohesive to me, so thank you for that. I have got a couple of quick comments, but I should turn to others first of all. I think Mark Chakraverty first, and then Mark, if you want to add. Uh, so, so thank you. It's it's wonderful to see the sort of the, the the breadth and depth of the work and the comprehensive uh, nature of it, and it's also important that we've got uh, a real plan against this ambition across a three-year time period of a very strong action plan for for the coming year. Uh, one request and one observation: the request is that in the action plan, the actions are clear the measuring progress is rather a monitoring statement. Monitoring comes up quite often. Uh, the, the ambition level of where we want to reach and what we're setting as a target um, is not there in most of those at the moment. So I, I can understand that. This is an area as you're learning your, as we're learning our way in as an organization, it's hard, but the request is, can we have a specific ambition that when we get to look at action plan 25, 26, we've learned more about where we should be setting targets so that we're actually very deliberate about what does improvement look like. The, the observation was there's a natural tendency to go to where we've got opportunity areas and that is definitely a, a good way of driving focus. But what it might miss is where do we have strengths in our organization that could be used to accelerate those uh, improvement areas and, and visibly calling out some of those strengths. So uh, making it not just focused on, on gap, but on where can we use a strength of what the CQC does and the, the CQC people to accelerate this journey. The, there are... <coughs> We have two executives in the room want to comment, and also Shami, and that's probably about all we have time for, except that before we do that, Hannah, I can see your hands being up, so it'd be helpful to have you comment first, and I'll go to James and Mark, which I think was the order, and then a question from Shami. Thank you. Um, and again, just echoing a massive thanks to Nadia and team for this fabulous piece of work. We're, like, as network chairs, we're really excited to be involved with this. And I think a couple of points that... Um, to, to build on is that this this does kind of uh, we've got a really strong foundation of collaborative working with Nadia and the team across the networks um, the work that we've already done around accessibility um, access to reasonable adjustments helping people to access the support they need without stigma we, we've we've worked really collaboratively on this already and so we're looking forward to continuing when we're looking at the actions in the strategy particularly around recruitment for example that's something we're already involved with but I think my biggest question is about how we create the capacity for people to engage with this work. So 
not just equality networks we already spend as co-chairs quite a lot of time outside of our working hours working on on things for our for our network members it's often not accounted for in workloads but wider organizational colleagues who are equally like fully accounted for minute by minute throughout the day-to-day -day work um so it often workloads don't account for that capacity planning in terms of time spent on online management, time spent on these additional um, things that we, we really don't want to be additional. Like Nadi said, we want them to be part of our every day. So how, it will be really difficult, I think, to achieve our aims here if we're not intentional about creating the space for people to develop and focus in these areas. So that's my plea, if we could have a look at that, please. It was a plea more than a question, but can I Perhaps, I know Mark and James wanted to comment, so let them comment. If you want to pick up on that, fine. And then we'll come to, to Charmian. Thank you. Oh, well, I just wanted to add my huge congratulations for this, this piece of work, which I know is a vast amount of work with many people that you led on. Uh, the collaboration is what I think w was was really struck out for me and the huge attention to, to accessibility. Three things uh, uh, popped out for me from this report the body of work around accessibility that we've already achieved and our aspirations for the future and particularly particularly on the technology side with the accessibility hub I think is is wonderful inclusive leadership pathway which has been an enormous success uh, in terms of promoting uh, uh, colleagues um, and then finally that workplace adjustment work which I think is something to be incredibly proud of which will help colleagues across the organization to really enable them to bring their best selves to work James? I, I wanted to welcome it too. I think this is really clear and accessible and practical and I, I like the fact that it goes into what does it mean for me as it were so you can really relate to it at an individual level. I wanted just to mark that I suppose it, this takes it down into work objectives and it's at that point around the development discussion and making that space managers and leaders making space for people to actually engage with this and, and to do it. it has to be at that individual objective level as well as the collective statements that we're making. The, the only the real point I wanted to make though was to, just to mark the anti-discriminatory ambition aspect of this and, and anti-ageist, anti-racist. It's a really proactive and positive statement. It's not just out, out, outlawing discrimination as it were. And I think that gives us a platform um, externally. If we can improve internally, externally, we'll be much more effective at challenging uh, this, the discrimination uh, in others. Thank you. And, and I mean, the board, for the benefit of those in the room who didn't know, and, and Hannah and anyone listening, I mean, the board spent the third of our sessions on, on race and equity yesterday, and I mean, questioning what more as a board we can do. I think it's a bit premature to give them time to get into that now, but uh, it is something that we are, are keen to do. Charmin. Thanks. Just again, echo that it's great to see it being a culmination of, of the team's works. Just a couple of things from me, and it builds on Mark's point, but a different level. I wondered if a, um, a sort of a bridge between the end of it and the detail was to say, really, how are we holding ourselves to account? I'm talking about the leadership of the business. How How is the leadership holding themselves to account for delivery? So what kind of things are you going to, to look at? If at the end of the year we're successful, <clears throat> what is that going to look like? And I'm talking four or five really key deliverables. You know, Has everyone been through EDI training, which we're seeing is quite low in terms of mandatory training updates? You know? Um, where are we with some of the, uh, you know, with some of the colleagues' survey metrics versus where we have been? So I think understanding that, holding ourselves to account at a high level, uh, would be key. The other one is we talk about zero tolerance stance to bullying and harassment, which I'm totally supportive of. Um, <clears throat> but I think we really, uh, well, as an executive team, it would be really good to see the team challenging themselves as to what that actually means in practice, whether it's the health and safety policy or the EDI policy. Zero tolerance <coughs> is a high threshold, which I totally support, but everybody needs to know what that, that means that everybody's signing up to because it, it, it is a high threshold, um, which is important, but it has repercussions that, that sort of need to be followed through with. So um, they're, they're kind of my key points. Okay, thanks very much. Um, <coughs> the um, I just had a, an observation and a question. I mean, well, the observation is we are, as we know, we've talked elsewhere, doing work on uh, values and culture. And it, I think this is obvious, but I would have expected that when we articulate the behaviours that we expect out of our values that somehow this is picked up. I'm not quite sure how. Uh, everyone seems to be nodding, but, but I think it's important to log that. But it would be inconceivable 
to me that we would come up with a set of values and behaviours which didn't link into this. I mean, we have to be an inclusive organisation. Uh, my question, and this is dangerous and a picky, but I want to make sure I understand. If you look on page 19 of the pack, which is 69 of the, of the full book, on the question on bullying, harassment or abuse, we restricted to CQC colleagues. But in the scores on determination of discrimination, we say at work, which is a much wider population. So quite a lot of that could happen uh, if, if particularly for our operations colleagues out at providers, do we have any sense when people answer that question whether the discrimination is taking place in CQC or whether it's happening in the workplace? I mean, it's equally unacceptable, but the levers we have to pull are quite different. So do we know how those figures would break down? And if we don't, actually, I might suggest that we distinguish in future surveys so that we understand. Sorry, um, we, we don't have a great a breakdown, but I think that's a really valid point um, because you're right, it's, it's, it's not acceptable in any form, but um, the approach will be different depending on um, which category it, f it falls into, but I can certainly take that away because I think it is a really valid point. Okay, well, I, I leave that as a thought, but I, I mention it. I mean, I think we should look at it, but I mentioned yeah. it because I came across a situation the other day internally where somebody was stressed and upset because of the um, discrimination that she had suffered when out at a provider. Uh, and it wasn't clear to me from the discussion whether she felt we had supported her sufficiently in dealing with the problem she had with the provider. That's why I say I think the method is different. So if there's any colleagues listening, <laughs> let me make it quite clear. The board stands you know, stamping this out. Uh, and if it happens at a prior level, it maybe you need to do something differently. But we will uh, stand behind you and take that into account. Yeah. Mark. Sorry, just two, two thoughts on this, one which might help in, re in relation to that. I think you know, if, we're, if we're wanting to achieve the culture that we want to achieve in relation to our institutional intolerance for um, uh, for the behaviours outlined here, then we need to make it psychologically safe for people to call it out. And um, an area where I don't think we're any, you know, better or worse than anywhere else, but where best practice really differentiates itself is protection for people who who uh, from from retaliation and victimization for people who who do speak up and speak out so I think I think there is that's an area that we should focus on what can we do in terms of risk assessments for people who 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 speak up following up with people um, three months six months 12 months later uh, having a look at their performance reviews at the end of the year to make sure that they have not been dinged uh, um, at, at the end of the year. There's quite a f few good practices there. They're not easy, but they're, but they're impactful. Um, the second thing to flag was just something I mentioned in Remco yesterday, that I think on recruitment, um, some of the barriers that, one of the barriers that we could definitely be ahead of the pack in reducing is this sort of catch-22 situation that you um, you, you know, you look at a job that you aspire to do, and then you read the required characteristics, and you've got to be able to, you've got to have done the job already. Um, you know, if we focus on cultural fit, if we focus on transferable skills, communication skills, leadership skills, people skills, um, uh, if if we're clear about the role, and assume that somebody who's applying actually has the appetite to learn and grow into it. And then we test that how how much potential we think there there is there, you know that's the sort of thing that will allow us to to um, uh, significantly broaden the pool because uh, it's not a terribly diverse pool for a lot of the of, of the jobs that we're that we're recruiting for. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so Nadia, Jackie, thanks very much indeed. I think you've got a message. We're all very impressed with this. Uh, and I like the fact of governance, you know, when it, we'll, we'll see the results of this, it plays out. So a number of thoughts to think about. We appreciate it. So thank you for joining us. 
let's have a comfort break. Uh, we've only scheduled 10 minutes, so it would be brief, and we're slightly behind, so if we could keep it to that, please. I suggest we convene uh, absolutely no later than uh, 10 to 4, if that's okay. Thanks. Welcome back, everybody, uh, <coughs> to uh, rejoining the public board meeting for the Care Quality Commission. Um, the uh, next item we've got is a paper, uh, it's really for note or discussion, on modern slavery uh, and unethical international recruitment. So, uh, Tyson, I think you can lead off on this. We, we have a paper which we have read, but anything particularly you want to highlight or update us on, and then we'll go to questions. Thanks. Right, thank, thank you, Ian. Um, I mean, we clearly have a, have a role to play when it comes to defeating the scourge of modern slavery and unethical in, um, international recruitment in health and social care. We're not a first responder, but we do have an important role working with other agencies and giving them the information they need. So um, Claire and Haley are going to give us an update on the actions that we've taken over the last few months as part of our contribution to, to the overall team effort. But before I hand over to the team, I think James wanted to give the board a bit of an update on some evidence he gave to a parliamentary select committee recently. Thank you, Tyson. And uh, yeah, so just to um, let that, um, uh, colleagues manage the detail of it, but um, I did want to let the board know that we were able to um, give some evidence to the House of Lords Committee on um, the review of the Modern Slavery Act, so the Act, as it were, that we don't have any formal responsibility for enforcement against, but do, obviously, as Tyson says, we're one of the key players. Um, and, and other than giving them the detail of what we do, which will be covered, co which is covered in the paper, I think we were um, we're strongly of the view that the Act itself needs modernisation. It does not sufficiently reflect the modern conditions that people find themselves um, under exploitation for, particularly around the financial aspects of exploitation, which the evidence, you know, is is um, uh, pretty overwhelming in the in the adult social care sector for. Um, and then secondly, um, the visa system and how that operates, and particularly uh, the, our principal concern, of course, is people's continuity of care and the impact when the application of the Act and the application of the visa changes takes place. And often staff members are finding themselves in a six-week period of having to find a new employer and the impact of that on people's uh, care. And uh, one of our recommendations to that committee was that that period of the length of time that that um, is operating for needs to be looked at and would be ideally from a local authority's point of view probably a three-month period of taking of taking the right time to transfer uh, someone's care from one setting to another or letting a new contract to a new care provider where international recruitment was a, a heavy aspect of that and then the second sort of policy point that we were putting forwards as well to the committee was that um, any consideration of uh, changing the um, shortage occupation uh, framework around social care um, would be a negative from our perspective. We observed the huge dependency of international recruitment uh, in social care and um, of course we, we would want to outrule modern slavery and, and spot it but actually any impact on international recruitment per se would be, would be negative from the point of view of um, the availability of care as well as the quality of care as well as the diversity of care as well. Thank you. Thanks, James. And uh, we're joined by Hayley Moore and Claire Bell. Sorry, I uh, forgot to welcome you earlier, but thank you for joining us. So, um, Tyson, thanks for your introduction and James for, for that contextual comments. So we've read the paper. Uh, questions from colleagues? Ali. Thank you. Uh, I thought this was a really helpful and clear paper that set out our position, the direction that we're going in. I'd be keen to understand what our experience has been since we published our regulatory policy position in 2023 in terms of what we've seen in the field and what feedback we've had from colleagues. Thank you. Um, we've been doing a huge amount of work um, externally, which um, Claire is our lead um, for modern slavery and unethical international recruitment. 
and we've been attending a, a huge amount of round tables and different contact with external stakeholders because because we're not a first responder organization it's about how we support our colleagues to be able to identify these issues and to make appropriate referrals outwards so to do that we've been working on things for example like a memorandum of understanding with uk visas and immigration and you know we'll be doing for example um, a data protection impact assessment on how we receive notices through from uk visa and immigration and i think some of the roundtable conversations have been really helpful too with for example the glaa because a big gap in all of this is the fact that the labor market itself isn't actually um, regulated in the same way because we look at care providers we don't actually look, for example, at all the people who are actually sourcing people through international recruitment and acting as middlemen. And because of that, it really opens up the chances of exploitation and the impact for the people who then in some cases might have, you know, sold houses, you know, set out to build a life and then arrived, you know, in England believing they have a job to find that there is actually no work, for example. So, you know, these sorts of situations are absolutely heartbreaking, really, for the people that experience them. But it, this is all about partnership working to take it forward. And I'll just come in there. For, for, for us as regulators, this is a new and emerging area, and we are learning what our role is in all of this. And part of that is then building the knowledge and understanding of our own workforce so they can identify those indicators and then take the, the um, appropriate action, which predominantly is to make that referral to the appropriate organisation that can take that action to, to get people safe and to hold people to account. But then we can look at that information through the lens of our own legislation and go, is there anything we need to do? Are there breaches of our regulations? What can we do to make sure that the people using those services get good quality care and are safe? Any comments from anyone else? Chair David. Thank you, uh, Chair. <clears throat> in, in one of the fields that I, I work in, which is with the uh, Medical Royal Colleges, um, they are concerned, obviously, about this whole area of unethical international recruitment. And, of course, also in terms of nursing, uh, professions allied to health, etc. And my question to you was, when you talk about the round tables that you've attended and participated in, are those round tables with employers, like ourselves, or are they round tables that include professional organisations? There's been quite a variety of organisations that have arranged roundtables. The most prominent one was organised by the Department of Health and Social Care, and that was multi-agency as well as um, provider organisations were represented. From recollection, I'm not sure that there was any uh, regulators of health professionals that were present at that time. The reason I asked is that having attended a number myself, I hadn't seen CQ, just a number, not, not all of them, obviously. I hadn't seen CQC represented there, so I just wondered what your locus was, really, for the interactions that you have. Is it from a, I'm assuming it's from, much more from a provider point of view, or is it for the, from, sorry, from an employer point of view, such as we are, or is it from the viewpoint of the providers whom we regulate and serve that have been present in those groupings? Um, a lot of the viewpoint has been, or the approach has been about how can we work collaboratively to develop preventative approaches, what safeguards can be put in place. Many of the um, international workers, the actual exploitation starts in their country of origin. So it's what can we do to educate them about their rights when they come to the UK, what preventative measures can be put in. One of the proposals is through um, gang masters about their um, licence for the um, labour recruiters, the labour market there. So there's, it's, it's multifaceted, but it's um, still early days. 
James. I mean, thank you. It's, it's in a sense that conversation. What it illustrates is that um, one of the points we were making to the House of Lords Committee is that there is no single organisation that is, as it were, taking an overview of all of this. Uh, and uh, one of the debates I think going on is: does does a single agency need to have that enforcement power right across um, all of the agencies? In some senses. The answer structurally is probably no, because there are a number of enforcement powers laid across professional bodies or ourselves as a regulator or, or, and, or the police and so on. Um, it's very hard to get a single view, but because nobody is taking a single view, you don't, you, we, are not, we are edging progress forward in partnership and collaborating as, as is described, but actually speed of response is probably what's required here. And I, I dare say um, at some point, Somebody needs to bring their ring together in a stronger way. And also to give voice to um, the migrants in this. There is no organisation that's representing that voice effectively at all, actually. And those, uh, as, as, um, as is outlined, people are paying thousands of pounds through a legal migration route, as it were, and are being exploited in the process without anyone really giving that proper voice. I'm not calling for CQC to have that role of course that's our position not for that not to be us but there is a bit of a gap in um uh coordination thanks james i mean it clearly it's not for us to stand in and take that view but given the point you raised that it probably puts the onus on us to make sure that as we learn as you said earlier that we are uh, have a voice and feed that in at the right place um and people seem to be pretty comfortable with this so th no other questions. Thank you very much for, for what you're doing. I don't think it's not an issue where we need kind of regular updates and say come back in July, but clearly it is an evolving field and it's a sensitive one at both a personal level for people involved and, and politically as well. So I think it would probably be helpful to, to schedule a, a further, even a very brief session at some stage in the future, just to get an update on what we're seeing and what we're learning. That's okay. So thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. Um, we've got a, um, a paper now on Martha's Rule. Uh, actually, I think we've seen this twice. It was in a, the board papers, I believe, a little while ago, and then we were running behind schedule, so we said let's defer it. So uh, the paper is, you have actually seen before, uh, really for information, but, but an opportunity to see if people have comments on, on the way we're thinking about it. So, Joyce, do you want to give any further introduction to the paper? I know we'll go straight to questions. Yeah, it, it was deferred from the last board meeting. Can I just briefly summarise, just to, um, because it might be helpful? Um, so, in February, the Secretary of State uh, published a statement on uh, supporting Martha's Rule, the rollout in England, um, which has been led by um, Henrietta Hughes, Dr. Henrietta Hughes, who's the Patient Safety Commissioner. Um, Martha Mills, as you know, was uh, 12 years old and had died because her condition wasn't identified, her deteriorating condition wasn't identified, um, and the voices of her parents had not been listened to, which is an example of epistemic uh, injustice. And so in October last year, um, several uh, arms length and national bodies uh, met in October, and we, CQC, were contributors to this uh, to support Henrietta Hughes in developing Martha's Rule and what it would look like in England. There's a, an example in Australia and uh, sometimes in other countries. And there are three bases by which um, Martha's Rule will be rolled out. It is a structured approach to obtaining information related to a patient's condition directly from patients and their families, um, at least on a daily basis. Trust would, must have a 24-7 access to rapid review from a critical, critical care outreach team. And all patients, their families and carers and advocates must also have access to the same 24-7 rapid review um, from a critical care out outreach team. And this is Martha's Rule. So um, the NHS have started from April um, and are asking volunteers for at least 100 trusts to participate in this first year. Um, they are looking at applications now um, and considering the, the various trusts who want to participate in this. It's part of a longer term plan to roll out Martha's Rule over the next few years where it becomes commonplace as part of the NHS and in the NHS constitution. 
our role, um, as I said, was first to be involved in those sprints where Martha's Rule was developed uh, and working with the Patient Safety uh, Commissioner. We have um, supported this and we did produce a joint statement with the GMC and NMC uh, about our support of this and how we would assess and, and regulate. Uh, certainly in the first year, I think we would want to be seen to be gathering information and rollout, supporting good practice, um, but it would eventually be part of our assessments uh, under our single assessment framework. Uh, we have been asked, and it is in the paper, would you enforce against... Uh, Martha's Rule. Uh, Martha's Rule is not a regulation. We would assess it under the single assessment framework. Um, the regulation that does exist around safe care and treatment would be one that we would look at should the, there be an impact uh, as a result, not directly of Martha's Rule, but as a result on people's uh, care, which may not or may, or may be linked um, to epistemic injustice or uh, safety concerns. So it, it not being a regulation means there isn't a direct, direct line to enforcement, but it would be part of our assessments and our view on regulations under safe care and treatment. Thanks, <coughs> thanks, Joyce. And someone was speaking very positive to me the other day about our engagement on this and our for, re, uh, for our engagement, rejoices engagement. So thank you for that. Uh, any questions for, for Joyce or comments, Belinda? Just, just a quick one from me. Do we have any indication of how often it's used in, a, in another country like Australia? It's been quite long standing in Australia. Um, Oddly enough, it, we talk about Australia, and I did myself, mm. but it's actually one state, New South Wales, I think, mm. uh, where it's Ryan's uh, law, right. um, and there are different states that have different ways mm. of interpreting. I think what we want to do in England is have one uh, process, the three points that I raised, so it's commonplace across uh, England. And in other countries, I'm, it, like in, in America, maybe it's federal as well, federal states, mm. uh, rather than across the entirety. But when it is used, it's used well and it's not misused. Uh, people advocate on behalf of their relatives or their carers uh, and they use the rapid review. There's, it's usually a line. It's not, we've talked about a second opinion. This is not just a second mm -hmm. opinion. There is a, a formal process by which you can get a rapid review. Um, and people use that process. They feel empowered to use that process. And they have actually improved. Where they've looked at outcomes and the impact, it does improve care for people. Just one question for me then. I mean, the, uh, <coughs> the, as a regulator, it is something you've explained, uh, what our role is. Uh, does this require any additional training for support for our people as, as this gets implemented across the NHS? Yes, I think it would be worthwhile for us to uh, support colleagues with the increased awareness and knowledge around Martha's Rule itself, but uh, epistemic uh, justice. Uh, we have started that because we published a human rights uh, approach last year, uh, and that includes what we mean by epistemic justice. I mean, the word itself <laughs> uh, puts people off, isn't it? It's, but it's about listening to people's voices and then valuing those voices as much as you would a professional. It's the, it's the weight at which you use people's experiences in our work. So there's more we need to do to support colleagues in that understanding. But I also think when we start to assess this uh, more formally than in a, in, in a less more, you know, more formally than in a descriptive sense, we would probably need to put some guidance out for providers as well. Um, I guess if I could just leave it as a, I won't capture an action of the committee, it's not the committee, but I think ask management to make sure that the, 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 the training and support has been put in place. I mean, apart from anything else, uh, well, sorry, we, that's the main thing, uh, but in addition, perhaps by the way of phrasing this, I mean, this is a measure designed to improve safety. Uh, so I think there are bound to be questions about how effective it is being uh, it's not up to us to implement the rule, that's somebody else, but, but I think we should be reflect now or recognise the fact now at some stage we'll be asked our view on how effective it's being. So uh, without getting it out of proportion, we need to, to recognise we need to, to do that. Um, if there are no other questions, thank you very much indeed for that, Joyce. Sorry to bounce you last time. Um, let's move on to the, uh, the business plan. Um, Chris, it's probably easiest if you lead off on this, um, although I guess Steph will be coming back in. Is that right? She's just... <laughs> right, Steph, we've been like a jack-in-the-box today in and out. <laughs> um, thanks, Charmian. Um, so um, this is down for approval. I think I'm right in saying we have seen it before, but... Um, 
So a lot of the bulk of it we've seen before, and, and I suppose a, a approved by implication, but there were some things that we wanted adding or to change. So perhaps you could briefly introduce uh, the paper, explain what has changed, uh, or anything you want to highlight for us, and then uh, go to colleagues for questions. I say bearing in mind we are being asked to approve it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, so we had the uh, draft of this at uh, the March board, but it wasn't. The, it, it was the measures that would be tracking. I think the, the private board we had a, a draft of this. So the first time we brought it together into public, of our um, of our, our draft plan for 24 through to 27. Um, so colleagues will have seen it, but uh, in, in this, in, this is the first time in this final draft. Um, what we've done is we've we've taken away comments from last time, which is re really around strengthening. Uh, reference to our people in the opening content, the fact that we'll be looking at our strategy uh, and, and just sense checking our strategy, but also we had quite a few TBCs around targets and measures, so we've just been looking at them and strengthening them up uh, and, and trying to fill in most of the blanks that we had previously uh, where, we were, where we were waiting on data to be gathered. Um, so this is, this is uh, the, 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 the final uh, version ready to sign off uh, to track performance against uh, for the coming year. So that's always plan to intro and take any comments or questions. Thanks, Chris. So, colleagues, questions, comments? Mark. So, uh, uh, again, thank you. It's wonderful to sort of see this and its evolution of it. It means that we're definitely maturing in both our uh, understanding of data, but also how data drives our management decisions. Uh, one request for disambiguation. Uh, very nicely, you've put some target increases for specific targets. Uh, at the moment, I could say that they're ambiguous because we have something like a 5% increase, and I'm not sure whether it's a 5 percentage point increase or 5% of the baseline. So just so that no one criticizes us afterwards, I would uh, suggest that we're very clear as to whether it's a uh, a percentage point increase or of the baseline. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just a disambiguation. Yeah. Uh, there are a few where we still have improve on, so just a directional goal, which could be okay, but again, the same request that we made before, which is can we learn during the next year as to whether there is a, a target or a threshold that we should be above that would have an impact uh, that, that makes a difference. Um, and linked to that, there are some where we can't year on year. At some point, when we're getting into the 90 percentages of things, we have to sort of say, that actually is above a threshold that we're comfortable with, and it becomes a maintain rather than an improve. So it's really getting into that mindset. Uh, and then my last one, which is a little bit nitpicky, I could not understand under uh, on slide on uh, page one two seven for us, or page six ten out of the report, under the uh, the the cases and timely triage. I can't do the maths that says if we hit ninety percent within forty eight hours for low risk and 90% for high risk within 24 hours, how do we get to a target for overall of 70 within 120 hours? So the, the, there may be some, I might be flawed in the maths. <laughs> can I can back on that, sorry. So I think that is our, um, I think we've missed some wording out to add clarity in terms of that. So. Um, the point A is cases overall, so all information that we receive as an organisation, whereas B and C are specifically around our information of concern, so those high priority, but some of them, even though it's a whistleblowing, it doesn't contain um, suggestion of abuse. So we just need to add the, that wording in, um, and hopefully that will then provide that context. Just on the first point, I think um, really agree with your points, Mark. I think the, the bit about clarity is we'll absolutely take that away. I don't want any ambiguity. I think the, the thing with this plan we've tried not to do is is, is see uh, perfection as, as our enemy here and, and, and go with what we know, especially when we've got new systems, new data. So we probably will see more in, improve than, than, you would, than you would necessarily want to see in a normal year with a target. And I would suggest we, we go with that and we'll monitor that through the year and then decide if we think we need to set some targets around any of those things, let's review them in year, and we can do that. Um, that would be my suggestion if people are, people are okay with that and, and, and challenge ourselves about what good looks like where we're seeing something that we're monitoring or just setting an aspiration of improve. 
I'm not saying it's pragmatic. I mean, the board is both asking for more insightful data uh, and new systems are have the potential to give us that data. So uh, I wouldn't want debate over exactly what the target should be to hinder giving us the information and then we'll refine it as necessary. So I think that's fine. Any other questions? Sharmin. Thanks. Um, yeah, great to see where we've got to um, and that we've added the section in on colleagues, which is good to see that, that piece being added in. Just on uh, on risk, I'm taking it that the appendix at the back is, is all we're going to kind of cover in relation to that. We're not going to put in sort of any kind of static point view of a risk register or... Um, our intention was to, um, in the business plan, to capture how we do risk management in the organisation and then in our quarterly performance reporting of the business plan, we will talk about how we're dealing with risk, the controls and our mitigations. Perfect, thank you. Any other questions or, or comments? I mean, just comment on the question, just building on uh, comments that have already been made. Uh, <coughs> yes, <laughs> I was thinking of useful if you're closer to the mic. Um, the building on comments made, I mean, the thank you for adding in the, the, the reference to people. I think it was something that was, was, was essential. Uh, <clears throat> it, it is, I think, an acknowledgement rather than this does not contain a specific plan we've talked about to deal with the current issues. This is a three-year plan, and we're taking it as read that um, in the very short term there are things to be done to address the, the bedding and other single assessment framework. So the fact there isn't more in here does not mean it's not important. It just means that that's, it's a more immediate thing within a three-year plan. Uh, but, but we do just need to make sure that given the starting point on some of the metrics we talked about earlier, things like the, the volume of assessments, whatever, that we're realistic about what goes in the plan. Uh, so that's not a license to say we can set extremely low targets because we have to deliver the right sort of performance for the market and, and to meet our regulatory requirements. But at the same time, if we are having difficulty operating at the levels we would like because of the pressures on people, it's essential that we don't introduce undue pressure uh, as a result of setting our last target. So I, I note the observation, but that's not to question what's in here. But I think when we come to looking at performance against the targets, we just need to be understand what's going on and, and respond in the right way. Um, question, uh, this is down for approval for the board. It sounds like people are comfortable with it. Where does this stand in relation to the department? We've issued it to the department in draft, uh, so just awaiting final approval from the department. Um, usually, that's, it's not unusual we wouldn't have that at this stage in the year. Um, got it quite late last year um, from memory, so it's with the department, uh, parallel to board approval. So it's with the department, so if we approve it, then you just tell the department this is now an approved plan, not a draft plan. Are people comfortable to approve it? Yes, OK. Thank you very much indeed, Chris. You rarely get such an easy ride. Steph, I think that's the last time we're going to ask you to shoot it. Um, <clears throat> a few final points. Um, uh, we uh, don't have a uh, Caldecott garden, uh, garden, Guardian at the moment. Uh, so, Sasha, do you just want to comment on the proposal? Yes, um, so basically in accordance with the 97, um, 1997 Caldecott report, um, we appointed Sean O'Kelly, Dr Sean O'Kelly as Caldecott Guardian, um, and he's registered um, with DHSC as such. But given his continued absence from work um, and given the importance of this work, um, we're looking at making a temporary appointment um, until we're in a position to, to sort of take longer term action. So... Um, Essentially, what this role covers, it's about um, overseeing our responsibility for addressing um, information governance matters, um, particularly in relation to patient identifiable information and making sure that we have an accountable board member um, that can oversee this work um, at a strategic level. So um, I think... What we are proposing is that we appoint um, James Bullion um, to step into this role temporarily, um, and so we just wanted to note this at board. Ian? Uh, just one addition to, to what Sasha just said, uh, the individual should not normally be the head of I ICT or associated with the ICT function specifically, hence, hence James rather than, uh, rather than Mark. Thank you. 
Well, it's obvious from discussions, James has nothing else to do at the moment, so I'm sure you welcome this additional appointment. Uh, but can we uh, um, approve James as a temporary Caldecott Guardian? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations, James. A bunch of flowers afterwards. Um, the, we come on to a few board and committee matters. Um, Mark, uh, perhaps I could ask you to give a commentary on the RGC. Thank you. Yes, very happy to do that. Um, you know, for those who are not familiar with the RGC, it's the committee that looks at the design, delivery, and effectiveness of our regulatory model. Um, our last meeting was on the 17th of April, which now feels like a very long time uh, uh, ago. And I don't think it would surprise people to to hear that there was, you know, our focus at that meeting was on delivery. Um, we we we. Um, heard a lot around the challenges around delivery of the new regulatory um, model, um, the challenges with the provider portal, um, the backlog of um, registrations, the, the knock-on effect in uh, in relation to notifications, and we explored some of the sort of drivers of that, um, acknowledging that this was despite the very very best efforts of our people who are, are um, as we've seen throughout this, consistently trying to do exactly what is, is right and everything possible to deliver on the purpose of the of the organisation. Um, you know, there's a, the, the, uh, we identified obviously at that meeting the need to you know, fix some of the identified issues and to solve together with our uh, frontline colleagues, the the some of the more difficult issues um, uh, and difficult decisions, and that work has continued. And many of us have had the opportunity to attend um, the operate some of the operations um, uh, conferences and other sessions with with colleagues, where we have um, heard more about the, the the way forward. And you know, one of the things we emphasise at the committee. Is you know the the importance of listening listening very carefully to the feedback um, of the experiences from our colleagues. Um, we also talked about the provider voice and you know particularly again emphasised the importance of making sure that we have uh, good engagement channels with. Um, uh, with, with small providers as well as the well-established channels that we have to um, to hear the views of of, uh, of our larger providers. Um, so, you, you know that work that work continues, and and I think it's you know since the since the committee, it's work that's that's very much been taken up as a as a as a as the key topic of conversation at, at the board meetings that have happened since then. Um, you know, we also heard about the, um, you know, the challenges for our colleagues in the uh, uh, in the NCSC, um, uh, you know, emphasising the importance, if we can, of uh, continuing to prioritise in inbound calls, continuing to prioritise safeguarding calls, um, but also in relation to the uh, the impact of the of. of you know, on notifications of the of the difficulties with the provider portal, the importance of supporting our co frontline colleagues dealing with um, large numbers of calls uh, and dealing with calls where inevitably some of the people bringing in are, are pretty um, fed up uh, and they're quite difficult, challenging calls for people. So we need to continue to look after our look after our people. Um, the uh, you know we talked uh, I mentioned earlier the the um, you know the need for us to have a clearer view in relation to the the many recommendations that we've accepted from various sources about how we could improve uh, of making sure that we understand the prioritization of that work and and we understand the path to delivery because these are all things we have we have committed to, to do. Uh, and we focused in particular at that, at, at that in, in that meeting on 
the status of the of the actions relating to f uh, freedom to speak up. Those are um, those are of particular importance to us at the at the committee. Um, we did manage to have time for a deep dive. Uh, this one was on uh, innovation, um, and I think the sort of you know some of the themes from from that were again unpacking this. Um, uh, you know the point that 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 um, in innovation is is not uh, is it, it is not synonymous with with technology, and when we are seeing technology applied it, um, as an innovation, it is not the technology that we're judging; it's the application of the technology that we're judging. Uh, and I think a really you know a really important point that again was emphasised in the discussion is that innovation is not something that is restricted to our outstanding providers because we've seen it, we, we ought to be looking for uh, uh, looking and capturing innovation in, in in every interaction that we that we we have with with our providers um, you know the key thing for us in relation to the, the new model is make to make sure that we are not inadvertently driving conformity and, and stifling innovation by our new more structured um, technique. That's not the intention, but we'll, it's something that we need to we'll need to keep an eye on and make sure that that actually it's it, it's surfacing and driving innovation and allowing us a framework for sharing best practice. Um, so that's that's pretty much what we covered. Okay, thanks very much, Mark. I mean, some of us, quite a few in the room, either members of the RGC or, or listened in last time, but uh, not everyone. So any questions or comments for Mark on that update? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mark. Um, uh, increasing for agenda, but I think the, the RGC has, has, has got its straps now, so thank you for that. Um, the uh, minutes of the last public board meeting, uh, we didn't manage to get these to you in advance last time, uh, so first time you saw them in this pack. They are quite long. Uh, but we seem to have ever longer discussions, but uh, hopefully you've got through them. Are you happy with them? Can we take those as approved? Yes, okay, thank you very much. Um, there is uh, an action log. Um, there are three items on it, all shown as green. Uh, items two and three are due in September and therefore are green. Uh, action one is not, because uh, uh, what it says here is that this will be presented to a private board meeting today. Uh, well, it wasn't. Uh, I think there was a, a slight misunderstanding, perhaps. Uh, but what uh, the action was aimed at is where uh, uh, LLRC actions are overdue, understanding better what the time frame is for dealing with them. Well, I won't say overdue, that's part of the point. Where they're not done, and we understand, we always said at the outset, not everything we done immediately, uh, but we need to understand what's going to be done and when and make sure we're comfortable with it. And there's some milestones in there. So I guess that's red, really, rather than green, but we will find a way of picking that up at the uh, either the next RGC or the board meeting, depending on timing. Um, you know, we are told there are plans, but it's just that we would like, as we would like to see them to make sure. James, do you want to add anything to that? Well, just to let the board know. So we, we undertook and uh, car carried out a review of um, LLRC and brought that to the Strategic Oversight uh, Committee. So it's been, it's been completed and including the external evaluation of progress by our um, external existing external partners to the process. So it has gone through um, the SOPIC process and is due at um, the ET, but was uh, postponed there and um, g given the very um, uh, heavy agenda today at private board and public board was postponed from there to um, uh, to our July meeting. But uh, happy that it's on progress for review, albeit we did put it back from today's agenda to, to July to give it a better consideration given all that we've discussed today. All right, thanks very much, James. Um, the, any other business from colleagues they want to raise? Okay, well, if not, um, uh, we do have some questions to the public. Before I close to those, just I'll close down the formal meeting. So thank you to colleagues for uh, being here today. Um, uh, super impressed. It's one minute ahead of schedule. Uh, uh, Hannah, thank you very much indeed for joining in um, and listening in on your observations. I know it's not easy listening on for hours on end on the screen. 
So um, on that, I will close the meeting. Our next public meeting is on the 24th of July, currently scheduled for 2 o'clock. Um, as usual, though, we have agreed to take some questions from the public, and we do have three. Um, <clears throat> so I hope I will, will briefly read the questions for the benefit of listeners and then ask colleagues to address them. Um, the first, I believe, is you're going to pick up Tyson, and that is how does CQC plan to further develop its protection for whistleblowers? Very topical question at the moment. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, the CQC's role as a prescribed body is to provide employees with a mechanism to make their public interest disclosure to an independent body where they do not feel able to disclose directly to the employer and the independent body might be in a position to take some form of further action on the disclosure. In our listening, learning and responding to concerns review, we have identified variation in how we handle concerns from employees and have committed to doing more to improve their experience in order to deliver on the recommendations of the review. Okay, thanks, Tyson. That's a very topical question at the moment. Um, the second one I think actually you were also going to respond to, uh, which was during its inspection of GP surgeries, how does CQC ensure that practices are complying with the requirements of the NHS constitution? Thank you, and thank you again for the question. Um, we don't actually map our methodology to the NHS constitution, but we regulate, regulate against the specific regulations. We cover both NHS and non-NHS services, and while there are likely to be many synergies between the fundamental standards and regulations and the NHS constitution, it wouldn't be appropriate for us to require different standards from different sectors. Okay, thank you. And uh, one third question, we'll give you a break from this. I believe this one is for James. Uh, what is CQC's view of the financial stability of the providers of social care services? Thank you, and thank you um, for the question. So we have a, a statutory duty as a commission to, uh, within our market uh, oversight scheme, to um, uh, monitor progress of financial uh, stability. Uh, that represents about 30% of the, of the market. Whilst you can't entirely extrapolate from that 30% to the whole of the market, given the complex makeup of a large number of small and medium um, enterprises, it nonetheless does give some insight as to what our perspective might be. Um, we, we said in our state of care, last state of care report, that the um, EBITDA, the rough, rough approximation of uh, profitability, um, our measure of that through market oversight, um, remained at the lowest level uh, since 2015 um, and um, the key factors for that um, measure are the uh, increased labour costs of, as, as we all know uh, despite progress on, on inflation uh, actually for social care providers that's led to increased labour costs and increased um, costs of running uh, the business as well. Um, and um, particularly for u utility prices. So there are external factors, as it were, driving uh, costs as well as the commissioning um, activity um, as well. Um, and um, whilst, there, whilst there are market oversight days to suggest there's been a modest increase in profitability from March to 23 to December 23, um, as some workforce challenges have begun to uh, ease, However, a number of providers saw a reduction in their financial reserves during the same uh, period, which, which makes their financial position less robust. Providers are telling us their key current concerns are whether increases in local authority commissioning uh, rates for 24-25 will be sufficient to cover their costs. And this is especially in relation to the national uh, living wage of 9.8% uh, that took effect from uh, April 2024 which could further erode uh, profit mar margins and present some additional risks for financial stability. Thanks very much, James. That's a very comprehensive response for something that goes beyond our responsibilities, but I hope that was helpful to the, uh, the questioner. So um, that was the last of the questions. So uh, for anyone listening, uh, say goodbye. <laughs>